the hour of uh, the hour of 12 noon having arrived, the Santa Cruz City Council will be called to order, and the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Newsom. Present. Brown. Here. Watkins. Here. Bruner. Present. Kalantari Johnson. Present. Vice Mayor Golder. Here. Mayor Keeley. Here. A quorum having been established, uh, we are going to move to public comment on any items on our closed session. For you unfamiliar with it, uh, there is an agenda. Uh, we will be looking, uh, we will be discussing uh, items one through three in closed session today. And uh, this would be the opportunity for anyone who is either with us in chambers or online who wishes to comment on any of those closed session items. This is your opportunity to do so. So first, let me ask if there's anyone with us in chambers who wishes to make comments. Seeing none, Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? Nobody online. No one online. Last call for comments on closed session. Seeing and hearing none, the council will stand. Uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Bruner, please. I have a statement of disqualification Certainly. for um, <clears throat> under closed session item number three, parts four and five, real property negotiations. Four is 110 Cedar Street. Five is 302 and 326 Front Street as it relates to my employment. Okay, so for clarity's sake, it is item number three, uh, and within item number three, there are additional numbers. So item 3.4 and 3.5 are Correct. the ones that you would be. Thank you very much. Are there other statements? Seeing and hearing none, we will stand adjourned into closed session. We will not reconvene here until at least 1.15. It could be later. It will certainly not be sooner than that. Recording stopped. All right. How are you doing? Following our closed session meeting, the Santa Cruz City Council is back in session, and the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Bruner? Present. Alantari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. And Mayor Keeley? Here. We are on oral communication. This would be the opportunity for anyone to address the City Council on a matter under our jurisdiction, but not on today's agenda. And you can speak up to two minutes, and we will take uh, folks one at a time here. And what we'll do is we're going to alternate in the event that there are folks online. We'll take someone in person, then someone online, someone in person. So please come forward. Good afternoon. Welcome to the City Council meeting. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, esteemed members of the City Council. I'm honored to stand before you today to share some significant insights into our community's well-being and the vital services United Way of Santa Cruz has been able to provide. First and foremost, I want to draw your attention to an invaluable resource we've established in the 211 phone line. In 2023 alone, we received 4,480 calls through this channel, connecting our residents with vital social and health services. Through these calls, we were able to provide a staggering 8,050 referrals, ensuring individuals in need received the support they required. In times of crisis, our responsiveness was unwavering. During disasters, we fielded 772 calls, offering critical information on disaster preparedness, shelter options, and disaster relief efforts. Notably, in collaboration with the California Fire Foundation, we facilitated the distribution of 400 credit cards to those adversely affected by the storm, offering immediate assistance when it was needed most. Understanding the diverse needs of our community is paramount to what we do, and this year, we found several areas where assistance was most required. Housing, utility assistance, food and meals, legal aid, and public safety services emerged as the top needs. Addressing these needs remains central to our mission of serving our community effectively. I'm proud to highlight some invaluable partnerships we forged with key agencies in our region. Community Bridges, Catholic Charities of Monterey, and St. Vincent de Paul stand out as pillars of support. Through these collaborations, we've been able to extend our reach and ensure that those in need receive comprehensive and timely assistance. In conclusion, I want to express my gratitude to each member of this council for your unwavering support of our endeavors. 
Together, we've made a tangible difference in the lives of countless individuals, embodying a spirit of community and compassion. As we move forward, let us continue to work hand in hand, ensuring our city remains a beacon of hope and support for all who call it home. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your fine work. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? We'll, we'll hold for a Good afternoon, welcome. Good afternoon, city council members. Uh, my name is Hector Aspecueta. I'm with United Here Local 19. Our unit represents the hotel workers and restaurant workers, especially in the hospitality area. Uh, and we represent workers in the central coast. Um, we are here to speak to you about the negotiations uh, to sell the city on land to a hotel developer, um, which you just discussed in closed session. Working class people like our members are suffering from these ever increased housing um, prices. They can afford to continue uh, living in Santa Cruz based on the fact that the housing continued, the houses prices continue to rise. Even as they make better wages with better contracts, they cannot afford the ever-increasing housing prices in Santa Cruz, especially our members who are forced to move further and further away from the coast. We represent the works at the Dream Inn, and many of them had to move farther and farther away from the coast, looking for a place to rent and they can call home. Um, and part of the problem that this creates is when they move away from the coast, they are going to have, they're going to spend more time on the road, creating more traffic and also creating more problems with um, contamination because of the greenhouse that they produce. Um, and the other thing that is also problematic for them is that they get to spend less time with their families because they have to spend more time in traffic. They're not going to be able to really spend quality time with their families, their friends, and whoever they choose to spend their time with. In the midst of this crisis, it is unacceptable that the city of Santa Cruz is thinking about selling this land for an upscale boutique hotel, which is going to have an spa <laughs> and a rooftop bar rather than prioritizing affordable housing for people that live in rural City you. staff has done play the problem Thank by you. saying the city building. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so I much. Can I finish? It's, I'm almost done. If you're almost done, yes. get done. All right. So this city staff has done play the problem by saying that the city is building a lot of uh, affordable housing. Tell that to our members that continue to move away. Thank you very much, sir. Anyone online? Good afternoon, sir. Anyway, I'm not buying what the mayor was selling in his latest Sentinel letter, that there is a housing shortage due to supply and demand, namely a lack of building supply, and that building more government-funded price fix, so-called affordable housing, is the answer. Today, I looked, there's 162 rooms for rent and 500 units for rent on Craigslist. The issue is price. The reality is, the main culprit of unaffordability is inflation produced by a corrupt and immoral government spending, which now adds a trillion of debt every 100 days, exploding the money supply. There are other culprits. First, those 20% fi uh, price fix requirements have discouraged building by for-profit developers and further the state's housing mandates, a new conduit for corruption consisting of nonprofit organizations specifically set up and certified by onboard politicians to receive awards and spend hard-earned public tax dollars to do the development, construction, ownership, master leasing, and or managing of housing that the state defines as necessary, whether it's needed or not. They believe the build it and they will come theory, building shoebox shrink Plated apartments, and if they cannot get enough low-income tenants, they always have the homeless to fill the gaps at public expense. It's a kind of socialism. It is defective free market interference that could also result in overbuilding, which could crash the housing sector and many people's lives with it. it discourages for-profit solutions because it is a rigged playing field by nonprofits who get subsidized, then pay no taxes forever, hoping to create a state monopoly of housing development and housing where these anti-capitalist forces fix prices and homogenize central planned housing. 
Of course, price controls don't really fix inflation and have never been a sound economic. Just last week, California legislators proposed free loans to undocumented illegals to help them in their oh affordability crisis. Unbelievable. Shoot me. Of course, the government could incentivize the private for-profit builders with a multitude of intelligent approaches, but they don't. The socialist subsidized solution has and will, socialist subsidized solution has and will limit the ability of for-profit developers to compete Thank actually you. curtailing building Thank you. with a reduced tax base. Thank you. And basically everybody else pays and, Thank and you. Uh, it's socialist. Okay, I'm gonna make sure everybody understands how this works. You have two minutes. You don't have two minutes and 10 seconds. You don't have two minutes and 34 seconds. You have two minutes. At the two minute mark, finish your remarks. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, council members. Thank you for the time. You have a very soft voice. Will you pull the microphone down so that, there you go. go Good ahead. afternoon, council members. Thank you for your time. My name is Martha Hernandez. I live in Santa Cruz and I have worked at Dreaming as a housekeeper for 28 years. As a resident of Santa Cruz for several decades, I cannot believe the city is planning to sell public land for a fancy new hotel instead of building affordable housing. Housing is not affordable for families like me. There is not enough affordable housing in Santa Cruz, and the determination of affordable housing is not accurate based on the cost of living in my neighborhood. I directly see the effects of not having affordable housing. There is crime and drug addiction. People do not have place they can go to the bathroom, let alone take a shower and drug use. And vandalism are done openly. This creates a health hazard for my community and having housing that is actually affordable would help alleviate these issues. Selling this land for a hotel de development instead of housing will not be fair to the people who call Santa Cruz home. The city and developer needs to think of the consequences of our city, such a homelessness and trash, rather than thinking sol solely of profits Santa Cruz residents deserve a decent place to live. Please prioritize affordable housing for residents over the profits of Hotel developers. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Welcome to the City Council meeting. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Celica Valdez. I am an organizer with Unite Here Local 19. I live in Salinas. I came to Monterey and Santa Cruz County when, in 1995, so a long time. So I've been enjoying the coast and the affordability that during these past 30 years um, I have been um, receiving. Um, it concerns me that the city is considering selling public land for a hotel development instead of affordable housing. You are sending the message that Santa Cruz is for wealthy visitors and not for working, working class residents. To me and to our members in Unite here in Monterey and Santa Cruz, there is nowhere like the Monterey Bay and Santa Cruz area. I love loving here, our members love loving here, but they have to be, leave multiple families in the same house because there is not enough affordable housing. Um, I cannot imagine living somewhere else. Please don't lose sight of the concern of the community. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon, welcome. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Luis Olip. I'm a union organizer in Local 19 even. Um, every single day I drive at least uh, one hour from my house to work. And then on the way to work. I cannot offer a, a house here in Santa Cruz because I'm spending an early two hours in the, in the, in the way to my, my job to home. Is, uh, is in the car exhausting and the top of the busy working day, um, I take like away from the time they call otherwise spent with my family at home. I spend a hundred and forty dollars in gas every week. And I live with my in Hollister with my family and my daughter's family because um, I have no choice. Uh, we need to live together because <clears throat> in Santa Cruz, uh, if I try to live in Santa Cruz, it's gonna cost me a um, $5,000, and then 
we need to offer our houses here in Santa Cruz. Um, I don't make enough to pay uh, that kind of rent, right? And uh, I respect, respectfully asking to uh, consider to families to in Santa Cruz or need uh, to affordable housing on use the land on development affordable housing for the lease instead of build uh, fancy hotels for the uh, tourists. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, <laughs> Council, and staff. Um, you all have a lot to get through, and um, there's another one I'm sure you're aware of about West Cliff becoming a one-way direction. I'm a proponent of two-way. I'm a part of three different nonprofits serving the community and beyond Santa Cruz Board Riders Club, Operation Surf, and Veteran Surf Alliance. Besides that, uh, I've lived in 14 different states growing up, so I had a lot of exposure to growth management challenges that face community councils. I can only, I empathize for what you have to go through to make the best stewardship decisions. Um, in researching this, uh, not happening yet, but we do understand there's a lot of stuff that's in motion. We ran our own personal survey through change.org where almost 2,000 signatures in a matter of 10 days for proponents of keeping it two-way. Some of the benefits on personal experience that I see at the top, having run different events around safety, I see that EMS response would be definitely impacted by reaching. I have personal friends have suffered critical energies, uh, injuries Excuse me, um, at Steamers Lane, other places, and it was critical that they would have life-saving measures to get to them. Uh, the other thing is traffic congestion. As we all know, we count on tourist revenue dollars for our community to do well. 50%, if not greater, experience and come to utilize Westcliff, and that's also beyond in this room and beyond in our community, this crown jewel that we have. Um, that's going to create a lot of traffic to the nearby neighborhoods, brake dust, exhaustion um, from cars, excuse me, exhaust from cars. There's a number of items that are going to come. And it's also going to further up congestion, bay, spring, through spring and summer months also that we already experience on mission or after 2 o'clock throughout Santa Cruz. This is going to be another measure of that. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nat Young. I am born and raised here in Santa Cruz. Um, I've grown up my whole life on the Lower West Side. I'm very fortunate to have, you know, been blessed to grow up there. And I am opposed to Westcliff becoming a one way. Um, Plateau has been one of the streets that's remained open. So I feel like I'm seeing the cause and effects of what is going on right now. Um, it seems like it's turning into somewhat of a highway and definitely not safe for young kids to be out there at the moment. Um, I'm also just alive, spoken to a lot of people and a lot of people are kind of unaware of the progress of this whole proposed project. And um, I just wanted to come here and voice my concerns and say there's a lot of people that are or opposed to it being becoming a one way. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Oh, thank you very much for being here and doing what you guys do. This is amazing. I appreciate all of you. It's hard work. I wouldn't want to be in your guys' shoes doing what you do. Um, you. I'm a, a member of damn near everything, and uh, I, the board writers asked me to come and talk. I prepared a 10-minute speech, and I, I remember two minutes. Okay. <laughs> so I just started throwing papers. Oh, bear with me here. Um, there was basically a couple surveys in regards to the two-way uh, the, the technical advisory board. That was, I've been a member for three and a half years and, and all the other. And the basic surveys were uh, the, the Say the Ways book survey and the uh, latest EMC survey. And they showed uh, the variety of things to do on Wesco, swim, fish, surf, bike, and everything. But they listed these such as walk and bike and everything else down there as if bike and box, bike walk and bike are the priority, and they th uh, assume that, and say that that's the basic priority. Uh, and I disagree with that. The survey showed the variety of things to do, not the relative true people use of West Cliff relative to, to cars. I took a survey, and uh, I, I, for the last three and a half years, 80 times, I sat up there in West, West Cliff for a half hour, and I came up with 80% cars, 16% walk, 4% bike. 
time and time again, consistent as hell. I guarantee anybody goes up there, spends 15 minutes, you'll see that. I talked to Claire about the, the other day. I said, go up there the next day after the 50-year plan. And she says, okay, we'll go up there. Talk to Matt Stark and go up there. I went up there. It wasn't 80%. It was 92% that day. The next six days, I took survey, and it came back to 82% cars. Consider what you're going to do with Westcliff. I think the use is the big thing. Consider 80% cars is a reality, 16% walkers, 4%. So if you're going to make a decision, who uses it, I think, it, think is the big thing. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, Sir. Th there was a book here, uh, 1983 survey, and, and this, uh, the, the facts in this thing concur with my survey results. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Very clever. Uh, next person. Good afternoon. Welcome. Hi, my name's Anthony Rufo. Um, I'm a longtime resident and born and raised here. I'm 60 years old, and I, I used uh, Westcliff pretty much on my, you know, it's a daily basis for surfing and a lot of other things. Um, I'm really, really disappointed in the, I go to the meetings that they have for this project, and in my, in my opinion, it's been directed a narrative towards one way without even an option of a two-way proposal. Even in the survey, all the nice pictures they have and pick this, that, whatever, there's not a two-way option. And um, I am fully uh, disagree with what they're coming up with. And so we, we decided to start that petition. And within you know a short amount of time, we got the numbers we're getting. And, and I think that speaks a lot because I think personally the the – the community in whole wasn't aware of what's going on because usually when the cliff falls in and stuff like that, it gets repaired and business as usual. There's no big issue. It's not even an issue of it's going to be a one-way or two-way. It's just back to what it was. And so we're not opposed to having the bike path that, you know, the group that we're forming here is we just want to make sure we still have a two-lane two access because that's important. It's important for everybody. It's important for the tourism. It's important for the community. important for access for emergency vehicles. And it's just what people are used to here. It's one of the selling points of Santa Cruz. It's like, it's beautiful. And it's an, it's terrible to see a narrative being pushed without even the option of a two-way being pushed at all in these meetings I go to. And so I, I had, to, had to alert my friends and stuff what's going on because people were kind of asleep at the wheel. That people didn't know these meetings were ab about getting rid of Westcliff as it is. So, and there's plenty of room as well. You go down there, you can see where they're repairing the cliffs. There's an area that needs attention, but it can it, all all the all the things they want. It can happen. It can be. It can be make everybody happy. And um, I'm just here to voice that opinion. And and we're going to definitely try to do our best. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Welcome. Yes. Good afternoon. Sure was fun to be in the supervisors' meeting. I left my notebook at a friend's house, I guess maybe too many cocktails, maybe I'm joking. But, uh, you know, fortunately the sheriff did finally show up. We had a really nice conversation this morning, almost felt like a job interview. Made it much easier to say what I wanted to say. You know, today was a great day for the Board of Supervisors to look really good because they were giving awards to people in the county that have their hearts in the right place helping the community. Um, so I lost my, I don't have my notebook. You know about the uh, street becoming a one-way? And maybe it should be a three-way street. I'm talking, about, I'm just trying to be light with conversation. So yesterday marked the first night of Ramadan and Al, Al Jazeera puts up the names of more than 13,000 Palestinian children murdered by Israel since October 7th. Seventh. One minute. Well, I took some notes for this thing, but I don't have them with me. But I have a couple photos. This supposedly was shared in 1990. America is a golden calf. We will suck it dry, chop it up, sell it off piece by piece until there is nothing left but the world's biggest welfare state that we will create and control. This is what we do to countries that we hate. We destroy them very slowly. Now, there's information to validate, validate this, that this is Benjamin Netanyahu, who is currently controlling the Israeli government. 23 seconds. Uh, you know, I, it was nice to explain to Mr. Hart some differences that we had, so there's possibilities of growth. 
I mean, if I were to run for an office, it would be as a constitutional republic sheriff. Most of the sheriffs we have are constitutional, corporate, demo democratic, democide sheriffs. Very clear distinction. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. So I just wanted to point out that the Silverside's vehicle ordinance, um, the boating community, community was pretty much blindsided. We had no outreach. We had no idea that all our detached boats were going to immediately get ticketed and had to be pulled out of the city. So the small boats went in driveways, cars went in the street. There was a net nothing out of that. Um, some of us who knew people were able to put boats in storage. Um, there's still boats out there that people can't find storage, and there's a two-year waiting list at the harbor. So I think that wasn't very well thought out. Um, I would like to see some changes in that ordinance. I'd like to see occupied detached trailers. I know that doesn't work 100% of the time. I'd like to go see it go back to complaint-based. I have neighbors that are complaining our boat's gone because they're not getting fish and crab from us. And I have another suggestion. If you charged $120 a month, that's what I pay at the harbor for storage, and you did that to 100 boaters, that's $144,000 a year you could spend on other projects. And I'd be happy to pay it. I'd rather give it to the city than the harbor. So that's my two cents. And nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else with us who wishes to comment on oral communication? Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? No, no, no. All right. We are on item four. This is a presentation uh, by uh, Linda Snook, the chair of the Sister Cities. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Oh, that's at four o'clock. Thank you very much. Thank you. Got ahead of myself on that. Uh, we are going to go to item five, and I'm going to recognize Council Member Bruner uh, to make a presentation. Thank you so much, Mayor. Uh, item five is a parking for hope presentation. Hope Services, as you know, is an important Santa Cruz nonprofit that provides training and support services to adults with developmental disabilities. Their crews have helped to keep downtown streets clean and welcoming for 25 years now. Each holiday season, our Parking for Hope program, in partnership with the Downtown Association, donates all the funds collected from downtown parking meters over eight days in December to Hope Services. This is in support of and appreciation for all that you do. Will you please stand, Hope Services? Today, we have with us... Today we have with us Hope Services Program Manager, Heather Perez, Employment Coordinator, Jessica Guzman, Crew Supervisor, Hector Castillo, and the Litter Abatement Crew members, Sarah, raise your hand, Cassie, Eric, Tony, is Tony here? No. no. And Mark. <laughs> I am so pleased to present you all with a check from our ninth annual Parking for Hope program in the amount of $26,670. This brings the total amount collected for Hope Services in 10 years to over $267,745. We are so grateful for your work and support and happy that this donation will help it continue.
Thank you. Please. Faith, um, I just want to say on behalf of Hope Services, we are incredibly grateful. Um, this will help our um, crew continue to beautify uh, downtown Santa Cruz. Would anybody else would like to? I hope, yeah, I hope everybody, when you see the crew downtown, you wave and say hello and thank you. They're such a positive, wonderful crew that out there helping keep downtown clean. Thank you so much. Thank you. We are on item number six. This is a Santa Cruz Mountains Trail Stewardship 2023 annual report. We'll be receiving an update from Emma Yusat, uh, who's the Trails Program Manager. Welcome, thank you for Hi. all of your good work. Thank you for having me, and thank you for working with Santa Cruz Mountains Trail Stewardship. I've met a lot of you before. My name's Emma again. Hi, nice to see you. Um, Yay, also shout out to Bonnie for getting my compressed file with like five minutes ago. So thank you for that. Yeah, so um, I made this little presentation. It's nothing too fancy, just some nice photos and stuff, but we can keep going along. Um, for those who are new to Santa Cruz Mountains Trail Stewardship, we're a 25-year-old organization, um, and we've been working with the city for over a decade. We build and maintain trails throughout the Santa Cruz, San Mateo, and Santa Clara counties. We, one of our main goals is to connect trail users to open spaces through stewardship, so through caring for trails. And kind of our goal is that everyone who uses trails um, understands and is educated about what it takes to care for trails. Uh, we host free classes and community events. Um, we have about three to four events every week. We're also a licensed California contractor, and our main objectives at all of our events and everything we do is safety, accessibility, and sustainability. So that's a little bit about us, but now I'm just going to jump straight ahead, just for time, into our stats. You can keep going. Um, so this is kind of a snapshot, and again, I know it's already in the middle of March, but we're looking back at 2023 right now. So this is uh, last year, our hours and um, kind of just of our whole org where we worked. Um, and this is a um, view of everywhere, not just city parks for this particular slide. And I will actually say this is actually a smaller year. The year before we did 10,000 hours, um, but this year we we're focusing more on quality of our programming and like who we were serving as opposed to just doing as many events as possible. But I'm, I'm pointing out this slide because I'm just showing that our volunteers, which are the blue uh, lines, perform most of the maintenance in the parks of the trail work we do. So our volunteers did around 6,000 hours total in parks around the county of trail maintenance and pump tracks. And our trail crew kind of focuses more on our new trail construction projects. And to back up a little more, there's about 25 of us now, half are on the trail crew, half are in the office. So we can go ahead and keep going. Um, okay, focusing more on the city of Santa Cruz and our amazing partnership that we love with our city park staff. Um, last year, we hosted 57 events in city parks, and this is kind of a breakdown month by month, but we can keep going. And this is a not as beautiful uh, sheet, but just kind of a total tally of what our results look like in city parks alone. So not every park we worked in, but you can see out of our 6,000 total, we spent about 45% of our time in city parks. So we had 547 unique volunteers, over 400 staff hours, and 2,300 volunteer hours. And we worked in all of these amazing city parks. Key stats. So those are the totals that were kind of listed at the bottom there. Our staff went out 96 times, kind of a lot, if you want to keep going. Um, and so all of these stats are actually just from a project reporting form that our team fills out every single time they do events. And I'm always happy to share those results because it's 
it shows all of these things per every single event. So for all of those 96 times that we went out, we have a project reporting form that shows exactly what we did, who we worked with, who was out there, um, and this kind of information. And we share that directly with the park staff. If you want to keep going, we're going to talk more about programs. So at the beginning of the year, we actually had to cancel so many events for a few months because of all the crazy storms that happened last year. And we worked really closely with Blake and Travis and Tony and got out there and did a ton of emergency trail response. So basically, we're kind of the eyes on the ground um, for the city and for all of our agencies locally. And we report and respond to trees that are down, trail hazards. And that's kind of our first response is to go out and do this sort of work. And so there were a few days where our team removed over 20 trees in one single day. Mm -hmm. um, so this is just a few before and afters, but we can keep going. Then moving right along into, aside from that emergency response and our regularly scheduled events, we had our summary with trail crew. I'm actually not gonna talk too much about this just because I already did a report on this earlier. So we can continue. Um, we worked with our summer 8th trail crew, uh, not 907 hours in city parks. It was awesome. So that's totally separate of our volunteer hours. And that's a partnership with the city of Santa Cruz. You can keep going. Some fun, cute photos. We had a great crew this year. We're actually looking to hire one of um, the students that went through the program as to help co-lead the program this year for the first time, which would be awesome. Um, and now I'm talking a little bit more about different partnerships we have in city parks. So one is Teens on Trails. It's a program we have, obviously, for teens, for people 12 to 19. Um, we also work with Earth Stewards, which we kind of umbrella under that. And so it's a partnership with the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. It's where every single month we take out kids in alternative education high schools to do trail work with us on different projects in city parks. And keep going. Uh, we also launched a new program last year called Hike and Help. It's every single Thursday morning for two hours. Um, it's been amazing because we've really recruited a lot of regulars, and that was the goal, is to have like five to ten people regularly joining us every single week. And it's supposed to be a low effort, um, accessible event that's not such strenuous trail work. And I know in these photos it looks kind of like it, <laughs> but it is just more of like a hike trimming, brushing type event. And it's been a huge success, and we love it. Um, we don't need to read this, but this is just an example of some of the comments that Mati, who is pictured here, she takes a really cute selfie every single volunteer event. She's our trail stewardship coordinator, so she's always there. Um, this is one of her comments that she submitted. And that was last week, Spring Rocks Trail in Poganip. Do do do, keep moving on. We just launched a new program called Senderos para Todos, and it is our bilingual trail work event. It's actually not bilingual, it's all in Spanish. Um, it's led by a few of our staff who are native Spanish speakers, um, and it's every fourth Tuesday, and we treat all of our volunteers to free drinks afterwards, also in city parks. So we worked in Arana Gulch, and last week we worked, or last month we worked in De La Viega. And then this is a program we've done, been doing for many years, Pump Track Keepers. It's every second Wednesday, and um, it rotates pump tracks. So it's not always at a city pump track, but uh, often it's at Harvey West Pump Track or the West Side Pump Track. So for 2024, um, right now our crew has been working at Wagner Grove. We're doing a project there in partnership with the city. Um, followed by volunteer-led volunteer events that are kind of finished work on Fridays there. And then we have our hike and help event every Thursday morning, our pump track keepers event every second Wednesday, Zenderos Paratotos every fourth Tuesday, and National Trails Day, our favorite biggest event ever. It's like over 500 volunteers, I think 620 last year. We work in seven city parks on that one single day, June 1st along with 20 other project locations around the county. And then we're gonna have a huge party at Woodhouse. We have a DJ, it's gonna be super fun. So I'll send an invite to that. <laughs> 
And yeah, um, I wanted to, I want to leave room for questions, but I also, I have one last thing that's more serious I want to say. Um, so I know a measure just passed, which I'm really excited about, tax measure to get more money. And uh, at SCMTS, we just want to advocate for the Parks and Rec Department. We love Tony. We love Travis. We love Blake. They're amazing to work with. I personally talk to all of them at least once a week. So do my staff. Um, and, you know, the city parks used to have the, an open spaces, 13 rangers that were on site and present all the time, kind of creating a presence in open spaces. And now there are zero. And it, it's really challenging, you know. It's also um, kind of scary. Like, I'm also on the board of the Coastal Watershed Council. And for my staff, the last time we went out to Emma McCurry Trail, I was like, okay, we're not... I don't want you guys to come here anymore. And that's really sad. And so I just have to say it. I want to advocate for some of those funds to be allocated towards supporting that presence again in city parks. Um, you know, a lot of people, they use trails as their, their like place of solace and how they relax. And I actually think it has a more serious impact. You know, we like, to, oh, trails frivolous like rec recreation, but I think it actually helps make our window of tolerance a lot bigger, and I think it is more of a serious problem. Um, so I just wanted to advocate for that because, yeah, I hope that I hope that more money will be allocated towards that presence. Well, thank you very much. Let me see if, if uh, members have uh, questions or comments, and we'll start with Ms. Bruner. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Every year we receive an update and I'm always, I just have a brief comment of appreciation um, to receive the stats and the impact that you and the volunteers and the team makes. It really is appreciated and I know it makes a huge difference. So thank you so much for stewarding our, our trails and open spaces. Thank you so much. Ms. Kalantari Johnson is right. Thank you for the presentation and the great work. Um, I just want to acknowledge and appreciate the work you do with uh, the young people in our community and really bringing forward um, climate change, climate response, and how we can take initiative and take action right here in our community. So thank you so much for cultivating leadership um, among the young people in our community and all the work that you do. Thank you. Madam Vice Mayor is recognized. I want to thank you as well, and um, everyone that knows me knows I'm out there every Saturday and Sunday. The first thing I do is my morning hike, and um, I really appreciate everything that you do, and I appreciate you acknowledging what's happening on M.M. McCrary. It is unfortunate, and I myself haven't felt safe to go back there since the last time I was there and found a body. So it was not comfortable for me, and I won't go back. So I really, um, it is kind of a call to action at this point. Thank you. Councilmember Watkins is recognized. I too will thank you for the work that you do. And it was a great presentation to hear about all the different um, demographics of our community and how they mm -hmm. can access our parks, how they can participate in being stewards and from young to old to everybody in between. So it takes a community to maintain the beautiful Santa Cruz that we have. And we're really appreciative of your organization contributing in such a meaningful way. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Councilmember Brown is recognized. I feel the need <laughs> to also thank you, <laughs> to also thank you for your work. You know, I've been out, I've met with you, um, others from your organization and been out on some of the trails on the North Coast, the work you're doing as well. It's not in the city, but um, the Tony Coast Dairy's work mm -hmm. is just incredible. Um, just so appreciate the, um, the investment that you all make. And I, I really want to highlight the the significance of bringing that many volunteers to a project that can be quite challenging um, and all, all of the benefits that we get out of that, um, but also people who are involved. And, and I really think that you make a super positive difference in our community. Um, it, you didn't mention it in the talk. Um, I think in part, this is something that's just outside the city or like right on the edge of the city limits. But um, I know that you're also involved in conversations about how to address um, kind of uh, uh, the undesignated mountain biking trails and kind mm -hmm. of DIY trails mm -hmm. that have emerged, and mm -hmm. there are some challenges there. Mm -hmm. And so I, um, I'll just mention that as well. I appreciate your engagement on that issue, and 
um, we'll be continuing that conversation too. Thank you. Councilmember Newsom is recognized. Thank you, Mayor Keeley, and I just uh, want to thank you for all that you do for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for all your work. I also uh, want you to know that you get uh, uh, the Blue Ribbon Award for <laughs> being the first one uh, before the votes are even certified asking for money. <laughs> good work. I, I think that's quite good on your part. And I imagine Mr. Okay, Elliott's I mean, it was a little long, there, statue, <laughs> long shadow is also involved in this. But on a more serious note, thank you for everything you're doing. It, it's really terrific. I had a, a, a previous position that I held. I had the privilege of authoring the two largest park and environmental protection bonds in the nation's history. Mm. And a fair amount of that went to acquisition involving state parks. Mm. The easiest thing to do is acquire property. The hardest thing to do is maintain property. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so what you do in our community in Santa Cruz County is really terrifically important. Uh, to do what you do would cost us millions of dollars a year. Mm -hmm. And you do this out of the kindness of your heart. And thank you so very much mm -hmm. for doing that. Best wishes to you. Thank you all so much. I'll see you next time. <laughs> yeah, we will. Absolutely. Very good. Uh, we are on uh, presiding officer announcements, uh, and I would like to make uh, three. Uh, one is I want to thank uh, the voters for those who chose to participate uh, a week ago. Thank you for doing that. Congratulations to the candidates who prevailed, and also thank you to the candidates who didn't prevail for running and creating an option out there uh, in the public domain. I uh, also want to thank all the election workers, and we will include in that Ms. Bush and her staff here as the city clerk, uh, but the folks at the county who conduct the elections, uh, thank you to all of them as well. I want to recognize Councilmember Kalantari Johnson for a, an, an announcement and some brief remarks. Thank you so much, Mayor. Um, I just want to take a moment and acknowledge the coming of Nowruz, which is the Persian New Year. And Nowruz means new day, and it's celebrated on the vernal equinox, um, the moment the vernal equinox takes place. And it symbolizes renewal and rebirth and um, the triumph and victory of um, coming out of the darkness of winter and into light. And it's been celebrated for over a 1,000 years um, by many different people across the world. And as we, as a city, enter spring and um, hopefully come out of these, these storms, um, I invite everyone to celebrate the Vernal Equinox and Persian New Year, or, or Nowruz New Day, um, the 19th at 8.06 p.m. March 19th, 8.06 p.m. is the exact time. Um, and so what we traditionally do is we sit around with family and we, we set, a, set a table and um, we just reflect on what we'd like to accomplish in this new year. So I invite you all to do that. So happy Persian New Year to you all. Thank you so much. Wonderful tradition. Uh, last uh, presiding officer announcement. I, I'd like to thank the folks uh, in our city who uh, deal with those experiencing homelessness. You're doing a really good job in that regard. The reason I want to mention it now is that um, across the street from where I live, uh, sadly, uh, a homeless person passed away uh, oh, about 10 days ago. And uh, it's a little park-like setting and uh, kind of got under a bridge and and uh, that is not unusual from time to time for that to happen, but it is unusual for someone to pass. The uh, city workers who showed up, or the first responders and then public works folks and then the water department folks because of the precise location, the level of compassion and dignity that they showed in that instance was uh, truly remarkable and I want to thank them for all of that work. So thank you all very much. Let me see if there are any statements of disqualification. I'll start on my left with Council Member Bruner. Disqualifications coming around this way, around this way. Seeing and hearing none, additions and deletions of the agenda. Uh, Mr. Condotti, do we have any additions on this? Ms. Bush, any additions? Let me go to the city attorney report from closed session, Mr. Condotti. Yes, good afternoon. Mayor Keeley and members of the City Council. 
this afternoon, the council met at 12 p.m. in the courtyard conference room to discuss uh, <clears throat> items on the closed session agenda. Item one was a conference with legal counsel regarding liability claims. Council received a report on the claims of Robert David Worrell, Sean M. Bergman, and Lisa Foster. Those are also item 16 on your consent calendar for action this afternoon. Item two was a conference with legal counsel concerning existing litigation. The council received a report from uh, legal counsel on the pending case entitled Alicia Lopez versus Mary McCoy et al., currently pending in the Santa Cruz County Superior Court. Item three was a real property negotiations item. Council received a report from its real property negotiator, uh, Economic Development Director Bonnie Lipscomb, on the following items. Item one was the real property at 25 Municipal Wharf. Item two was the real property at 55 Municipal Wharf, Units B, C, and D. Item three was the real property at, excuse me, uh, Municipal Wharf, 55 Municipal Wharf, um, B, C, and D, and apparently that's a typo on the paper. Item four was real property at 110 Cedar Street. And item five was real property at 302 and 326 Front Street. Um, those last two items, Council Member Bruner recused herself and uh, excused herself from the closed session agenda, uh, meeting due to um, a potential conflict of interest involving her employer. And that concludes my report. Thank you, sir. Council meeting calendar. Ms. Bush, anything to draw to our attention? No, not nothing. Thank you so much. We are on the consent agenda. For those of you unfamiliar with it, what we'll be doing is taking items 8 through 18 inclusive on one vote. One motion, one vote. What we'll do is I'm going to go around the dais here, and then we'll go out to the public. If any member of the council wishes to pull an item, comment on an item, or question, ask questions on an item, we will move through that. Then I will give you, the public, the opportunity to comment on an item as well. If you are going to be commenting on all, excuse me, on multiple items, you're going to get one opportunity to speak. So you'll get one opportunity to speak on the consent agenda. If you have one item or whether you have six items, you're going to have the same amount of time to do that. Let me start with Ms. Bruner on the consent agenda. Thank you, Mayor. I had a quick comment on item number 10. Please go ahead and make that. Item 10 is uh, authorization for application and acceptance of pro-housing incentive program funds. And I just wanted to call uh, this out. Uh, the City of Santa Cruz earned pro-housing designation a few months back at the end of 2023. In fact, only 30 jurisdictions in the entire state received this um, designation, which makes us eligible for funds uh, towards affordable housing. And um, this is such a great example of that, that designation and the use of this to really assist with um, our Santa Cruz community residents um, f and to work in partnership with Community Action Board um, for rental assistance program, emergency eviction program, um, all of the things that, all the tools and things we need to continue supporting our community. We had several uh, members speak in oral communication about affordable housing. Um, so this is just one more uh, thing I wanted to call out that I'm really happy to see an application for a grant of $500,000 that will go towards um, helping our community. Thank you to city staff for um, finding this grant, and, and I'm so glad we're eligible because... We are only eligible because we received pro-housing designation. It's been a great feat, so thank you. Further on consent? 
Very good. Ms. Kaltari Johnson is recognized. Thank you. A uh, brief comment on item 13, which is the proposed expansion of marine protected areas and removal of one mile buoy. Mm -hmm. um, I want to acknowledge Vice Mayor Golder for bringing this forward and Mayor Keeley uh, for bringing this agenda item forward. Um, we heard from a lot of community members, and it's clear that there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. This impacts our um, fishing community, it impacts the safety of those who are out in the water. So. Appreciate bringing this forward. Okay. The vice mayor is recognized. I had a similar comment, and okay. I wanted to um, thank um, thank you, mayor, and other council members who are you know interested in um, diving a little deeper into this. And I appreciate the um, fishing community. I can see out there. We got your emails. We got your letters, and um, I'm happy this is on the consent agenda. Um, thank you. Very good. Councilmember Watkins is recognized. Thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. I will associate myself with the comments made on item 13. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate you bringing this forward, raising awareness, and certainly from our community members who reached out um, expressing concern and su support for this item. I also just wanted to thank um, my colleagues for bringing forward item 14, Count, uh, Council Member Brown, mm -hmm. Vice Mayor Golder, and that's um, establishing or, or expressing our support for establishing a regional program for all-inclusive care for our elderly and to provide high-quality health services for low-income seniors. I know age-friendly communities is a priority that we have. It's a statement we've made um, in the city as well as throughout the county. It's been something that Councilmember Brown and I have definitely shared an interest in wanting to see move forward. And this is what we need in terms of tangible resources for that population. So I appreciate you bringing that forward as well. Okay. Councilmember Brown is recognized. Thank you. Well, I'm going to associate my uh, com <laughs> my comments with uh, those of Council Member Bruner on item 10. Um, I would just add that, um, and all of these items actually, uh, I would just add that you know the the eviction prevention is such a critical tool. Um, we know that the cost of um, providing assistance and services to get people housed is significant. Um, once people lose their housing, that is really where the crisis begins. So um, to have an opportunity to provide more resources to help people stay in their homes um, is just is so critical. And I want to thank our staff for focusing in this priority area as well um, under the pro-housing designation. Um, thank you to my colleagues for bringing forward the marine protected area item. I think there is a lot more to be said, and th this is going through a process. So your early input, um, folks out in, in the community, your early input is has been important as well. Uh, and then on item 14, absolutely. Um, this is something that I think, you know, this is a proposal to um, bring a, a significant additional resources into our community. I wanna thank Alicia Rodriguez, did I get that? Out in the audience is, is here and is really instrumental in moving this forward. Um, and uh, you know, I just think that we are, we're so lucky to have um, your, uh, your, your positive, uh, intervention here and in your work to make this happen and that's all for consent thank you thank you council member newsom is recognized thank you mary keely i want to uh quickly just associate myself with the comments of council member brown and council member bruner on uh, item number 10. i'm very excited to see uh, this uh, item on our agenda and really happy to see that we are leveraging our pro housing uh, designation to provide five hundred thousand dollars to the emergency eviction program which is a great program for our community and much needed so thank you, thank you. On uh, on the consent agenda, uh, comment on item 13. Uh, and I'll, I'll do this as briefly as I can, but I can't promise it's going to be terribly brief. But I'll, I'll do it as briefly as I can. Uh, when when I got to the legislature in 1996, uh, for 150 years, California had decided that how you manage the marine environment is not to manage it much at all. And as a consequence of that, overfishing and other pressures on the first three miles out along the state of California was in dire, dire straits. So I authored the Marine Life Management Act, Marine Life Protection Act, California Ocean Science Trust Act, which created a whole bunch of things, not limited to the uh, targeted implementation 
and proposed, uh, proposed and then implementation of marine protected areas. Marine protected areas come in a wide variety of flavors. Uh, they can be no-take zones, they can be limited entry, they can be scientific research areas, they can come in all kinds of, of forms. And so not too long ago, the question was, should we do that, uh, take a look at that at, uh, at uh, Pleasure Point, and should we take a look at that at Natural Bridges? And I think taking a look is probably not a bad idea, uh, but as this idea has moved along, it seems that the scientific evidence is really not there at this point to support the establishment or expansion in either one of those areas. And so today's agenda item says, uh, unless there is a lot more good scientific evidence that is proposed by the outstanding marine research institutes here in the Monterey Bay uh, that we don't support that, and I think that is the right position. I appreciate the opportunity to have met last week with some of the folks who are concerned about that in the fishing community, uh, as well as others, divers and others who, who uh, live, work, and play in the uh, near shore coastal waters. So thank you all for that, and thank you for making this item a, an item that we can presumably all agree on. With that, let me now go out to the public if you wish to make a comment on an item or items on the consent agenda, this is your opportunity to do so. Good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon. My name is James Ewing Whitman. So, I don't have my notebook. Okay. So, number nine on the consent agenda, number 13 about the, um, the three miles away. But, I guess before that, I really have some questions about what is going on with the jurisprudence in this room, because it seems to change every time I'm here. Um, absolutely. I'll be brief. It just almost changes every time I'm here. Um, so we'll start with the good first. The coastal, the, uh, about the, you guys being opposed to the three miles right now and keeping the one mile buoy, you're four that, just like the county is. They want more information. They just don't want to close this down to fishing, swimming, and all kinds of stuff. I believe you, anyway, I'm pretty sure that you guys are for caution on that. The county of Santa Cruz is. There was a gentleman who spoke who's been using the water in an abalone diver for over 40 years from here to Arcata. You know, he described the issue being, um, the fact that for whatever reason the giant starfishes are gone and the purple sea urchins have taken over. Um, so I'm still on that item, but it kind of relates to misspeaking with the minutes before. When I, I misspoke when I said that carbon dioxide is uh, just under, just under a half percent of our climate, of our atmosphere. It's actually one part for every 2,375. So all the people who are talking about sustainability and carbon dioxide, they really don't sound all that intelligent. That's as polite as I can be on that one. Um, because we're at, we have extinction level carbon dioxide right now. It needs to be higher. So how that relates to what's going on in the ocean, absolutely the kelp turns carbon dioxide into oxygen, and we need oxygen. Our atmosphere is, what, 17 18% right now? Enough on that subject. Going back to the minutes, there is a presentation about Black History Month. Found that extremely beguiling, that the public was not allowed to make comments. There's a gentleman who wrote a book called Every Black Life Matters. His name is Kevin McGeary. He went into the white supremacy situation going on, and we have, how much time do I have, 20 seconds? It's hardly enough. So I'm really questioning why the Black Lives Matter sign is right there, because it makes sense that you didn't acknowledge that as helping black people, because that stands for white supremacy, and so does, I wish I had more time. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm going to talk about item 10. I, I'm not necessarily all that against the good parts of it, but I 
uh, I'll say that um, you know applying for California pro housing grant money, as I've said such things about grants before, that the government has issues, and it's government's different from being a private sector capitalist, but it's similar to normal capitalist people and businesses that it should try to provide with other people, meaning the people in your jurisdiction, need, want, and are willing to pay for. Of course, that willing to pay for part is the weak link with government. Again, when you take the big outside money, and total grants administered is big money in this city, from sources outside the city, you are forced to do their bidding, which is not necessarily what the people want. There are strings attached. There are costs attached. It can be and frequently is a competitive process where cities fall all over themselves, making even further commitments they hope will gain favor from the state, and it doesn't necessarily have to be what their public's will is. The state ex exacts restrictions, commitments, deliverables in exchange for the monies. The public never normally reads about any of those strings attached. They're not explained in the agenda. I doubt many of you really know what they are, are asked here to approve the application and submit without actually seeing the application uh, or well, everything behind it. Uh, the, there's a grant program with only a single line referencing the purpose. Uh, or you explain or track accountability of it at all and any public hearings if required review for public comments are outside this council process and are probably only attended and commented on by those who benefit from the public monies to be spent or are unknown comments sent directly to the state housing and community development during the comment period within the next 30 days again by who knows what when or who uh, except probably the beneficiaries there's 37 pages of grant compliance known as approved permanent regulations for pro-housing designation, which reference a great many more regulations, or should I say strings attached. No time here to examine all 37 pages, but one such string is that there cannot be local voter approval requirements related to housing production, such as Measure M. Although M appears to have failed, it is precisely an example of where these kinds of grants turn you into quizlings of the state, a very defective left of state at that, to get state monies whether the people would want something different or not. I personally like the idea of public votes to change maximum uh, building height zoning, not so much the other part about increasing affordable housing to 25%, uh, but who knows how that vote would have gone if M was only about building heights. Did, uh, well, hypothetical question, did, did being a pro-housing city that's as, AKA a state quizzling city, taking the big outside money cause you to strongly oppose what the people wanted to vote on. I wonder. Uh, and I would say that, you know, the people here, I don't believe they really want a much denser city, a much more crowded city, a, a city with super high buildings. Yeah, they want people close. Next person in line, good afternoon, welcome. Good afternoon. Hi, City Council. Um, to save your time and to <laughs> thank you. really just I want to thank show you appreciate. Mayor. Yeah. Um, <laughs> look, we just wanted to create awareness and to have a pause on this push that for this MPA, and we would love to be involved as the local community. We want our local scientists and experts involved too, and we are so appreciate appreciative that you've recognized that. So thank you very much. Your voice matters too in this process, and. Um, Anybody else want to say anything? No, but no one then. Yes, I'm talking. <laughs> <laughs> Typical. Um, I want to say that I am fortunate enough to have eyes. I'm a resident of Pleasure Point. I'm fortunate enough to have eyes on the water. And these activities, fishing, kayaking, boating, are so infrequent out there that I can't imagine our activities as residents are degrading the kelp forest, and I don't believe the science is there to support it. And frankly, I'm offended that it's people that don't live in our community that want to dictate what we can do in our local waters. So thank you so much for taking all of our comments into consideration. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you all. I yeah. would just like to add, too, that sure. we represent a, a broad and diverse array of perspectives on this, and so there's members within the local spearfishing community, angling community. I'm coming from the scientific background. I work with, with many of the preeminent scientists on, in the fields of kelp forest ecology and MPA science. I think you guys all received my letter last night. Um, so I just wanted to, again, thank you for taking the time and for hearing our, our various perspectives. Yep. Very good. 
Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being good stewards of the ocean. Good work. Any other public comments on our consent agenda? Anyone online? No. Very good. Consent agenda is, we are on a motion to approve the consent agenda. There's a motion by the vice mayor, a second by member Kalantari Johnson. Debate or discussion? Seeing in. No? Okay, seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Kiewit? Aye. The motion passes and so ordered. We are on item 19. Uh, this is uh, a United States. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, United States uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development Annual Action Plan and Amendment to the Citizen Participation Plan. We are going to receive uh, up to a 10-minute presentation by staff. And uh, I'm imagining that we are going to have the Jessica team <laughs> with us today. Ms. Mello, Ms. DeWitt, thank you both so much for being here. Thank you for inviting us here today, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor. Really, uh, we appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak to you today about the uh, annual action plan for 2024 uh, and the budget. So as you mentioned, my name is Jess Meller. I'm the Housing Principal Management Analyst. And with me today is Jessica DeWitt, the Housing and Community Development Manager. Um, so as a little background, uh, HUD is the Federal Housing and Urban Development Department, and they grant the City of Santa Cruz Community Development Block Grants, which are also called CDBG, and Home Investment Partnership Grant Funds, which are also called HOME. Um, since the city is an entitlement jurisdiction, we receive CDBG and HOME funds annually based on the federal budget allocations to HUD and HUD determines the amount of each entitlement grant by a formula which uses several objective measures, and the annual action plan is the same proposal for how we spend those funds. Um, as you'll see momentarily, we're currently more than halfway through our action plan timeline, and it started with the release of our notice of funds available in October with an application period open through mid-December and a review of applications for eligibility and uh, reviewing those against the anticipated available funds for the program year. We then brought those recommendations for funding to the Health and All Policies Committee uh, last month for their input and direction. And today we're presenting those recommendations to you at this first public hearing. And there will be a second public hearing, which is currently scheduled for April, which will finalize the funding awards and we'll submit those to HUD in May. Um, so the action before you today is to make an initial funding recommendation for the 2024-25 HUD action plan for both CDBG and HOME, and to amend the citizen participation plan, some normal and routine updates. And you'll see in red, um, we're suggesting um, taking no action on item number three in your agenda today, which is the drafting and submittal of a letter to Congressman Panetta regarding funding levels for CDBG and HOME, and that's because as of today, Congress has passed and President Biden has signed into law a final fiscal year 24 spending package for six appropriation bills, one of which includes transportation, housing, and urban development, which is how HUD gets their CDBG and HOME funds, among other uh, funding programs as well. Um, so to, to let you know, I'm sure you're curious, the funding bill maintains the level of CDBG funding at the same level as last year's. So they're going to be funding HUD at $3.3 billion for the CDBG program. And it has funded home program at $1.25 billion, which is approximately $250 million below last year. Um, and HUD still needs to determine how much the city is going to be getting for those two programs. So that's still uh, outstanding. Um, over the past 15 years, the city has seen fluctuations in funding from HUD 
both under our CDBG and home programs. Um, in 2015, we had uh, a slight increase after an, a decline in 2011. And again, we're seeing after a 2021 decline, we're seeing a slight increase, which is encouraging in both our CDBG and home programs. Um, and as I just mentioned, uh, the funding award amounts for these two programs haven't been released by HUD yet. They have about until the 16th of this month to do that so that we can stay on schedule with our submission deadline. And we'll keep you appraised of any funding updates or any schedule changes as necessary. So at a glance, our CDBG funding breakdown um, is looking like this. We've got, uh, we're anticipating that HUD will allocate approximately $568,725 pending their final determination. We're also estimating that we will receive $25,000 in program income, which is income we earn on loans that have been funded from prior CDBG fund years. And there's currently no prior year funding that we have available for reallocation this year. So in total, we're expecting approximately $593,725 for the CDBG program. And HUD does um, have a set aside formula for 20% of our grant and program income that we can use for administration of this program. Mm -hmm. So this would cover the city's cost to directly administer CDBG. And we also have administrative costs with two other city programs that we need to cover, which is the rehab administration item on here on the line item and the home security deposit program delivery costs. So that leaves us with $463,980 for our public services and programs that we can allocate. So this year, we received five program applications, one from the Teen Center, which is run by our Parks and Recreation Department and provides teen-focused programming in the community, one from Second Harvest Food Bank's Food Distribution Program, which reduces food insecurity to our lower-income residents, one from Housing and Economic Rights Advocates Housing and Stability Legal Services Program, which would provide legal services to low-income households. One from Gray Bears Healthy Food Program, which would provide healthy meals to members of the community. And one from Nueva Vista Community Resources, which provides programming to lower-income residents at both the Beach Flats Community Center and La Familia Center. Our recommendations here um, HUD caps the funding that we can spend on public service programs to 15% of our grant. And so we're estimating um, that that cap will be $85,400. HUD does allow um, cities that have community-based development organizations or CBDOs that operate in a neighborhood revitalization strategy area or NRSA to receive funding above the 15% cap. So we're able to go over that 85,000. Um, we currently have one CBDO, which is Nueva Vista, and we've uh, marked with a star on the slide. Um, so we can actually exceed that 15% cap with total funding towards services. Um, so our recommendation is to fund four programs at their full request, the Teen Center, Second Harvest, Housing and Economic Rights Advocates, and Nueva Vista Community Resources for a total of $232,500. And this will allow us to maximize our CDBG funding for programs and public services. Um, we received one project application for this program year for the, from the Boys and Girls Club of Santa Cruz County, and that is to renovate their downtown clubhouse. So these renovations would include uh, addressing a leaking skylight, gutters, downspouts, improvements to storm drains, and replacement of doors inside their pool area. So they requested 246,500. However, we are only estimating that we'll have 230,580 available for programs. So with that in mind, we're recommending to to fund that project with the remaining CDBG funds available, $230,580. And in summary, for CDBG, we are recommending our community programs funding at $232,500, our capital projects at $230,580, and administration for city and city programs at $130,645 for a total of $593,725.
All right, and now on to our, our home program um, at a glance. We're anticipate, we were anticipating home would fund us at approximately $499,440. That may be subject to change based on our final allocation. Um, and we're also estimating we'll receive $100,000 in program income. And in fact, in January this year, we received a mighty large loan repayment of over $1 million. So we have that available to allocate to programs and projects this year. Mm -hmm. Um, for a total of $1,890,516. So like the CDBG program, HOME also has a set aside for administration, and that's 10% of our grant and program income. So that's estimated at $59,944. So we're going to subtract that out of the total we have available. Um, they also have a requirement to set aside 15% for uh, community housing development organizations, or CHOTOs, and those are non private nonprofits that create affordable housing in the community. And so we have to set aside that funding as well. So we're looking to, to award that as well to a project. So we have $1,755,656 to allocate. Now we're proposing to do that with the two applications that we received for home funding this year. One is our security deposit program, which we administer in partnership with the Housing Authority of the County of Santa Cruz. And one is for the Downtown Library and Affordable Housing Project. The security deposit program was funded by alternate sources in prior years, um, also with HOME in, in years before that. It's currently being funded by our HOME funds this year. And it's primarily limited to helping low-income households at or under 60% of the area median income. And it provides households with one month's rent as a security deposit. Uh, the Downtown Library and Affordable Housing Project, which I'm sure all of you know a lot about at this point. Um, it, it contains 124 units in the housing project, and it ranges in size from studios to three bedroom units. It's 100% affordable, and this allocation is targeted at filling the gap in funding for this project. So we're trying to be filling in what they need, the last in, so that, which is one of home's requirements. Um, this project also has other components, such as the library, um, parking and commercial, and awarding the home funds to the housing part of this project will actually allow other previously awarded funds um, to be utilized for components other than housing. So we're able to, to help better fund the, the project fully. Um, so in summary, we are recommending to fund the security deposit program at $80,000 and the downtown library and affordable housing project at $1,750,000. $572, um, which includes that CHOTO set aside I mentioned earlier as well. So we've got a total, total big impact for our programs and projects, $1,830,572. To wrap it up, our next step. So after we get your approval today for the budget, we will be drafting the 2024-2025 annual action plan and we'll be updating our citizen participation plan. We'll make those available for review online. Um, we will also hold a second public hearing to finalize the budget for the action plan. We will provide an opportunity for public review and comment again, and then we will submit the final action plan to HUD. And we're expecting that funding for programs will be available as early as July 1st. Project funding will likely be available for fall and winter. And one last thing, um, we were recommended at the Health and All Policies Committee meeting in February to provide you all with an update on how our programs are faring. Um, so we'd like to share an update on how, how they're doing. We will be providing uh, updates in the future about projects, but they're currently, mm -hmm. currently still underway. Um, so our program highlights include the Home Security Deposit Program, which to date has assisted eight households. The Housing Authority anticipates that we will see an increase in the request throughout the remainder of the program year, so that's through the end of June this year. Um, our teen center has seen over 160 teens participating in the programs available, including recreational activities like basketball, pool, video games, and special day trips and events. Nueva Vista Community Resources has provided services to over 600 individuals including the 2023 Summer Fun Series that offered recreation opportunities 
in collaboration with community partners and organizations. And then the Second Harvest Food Bank has provided food resources to over 28,000 community members to help address food insecurity and instability and partnered with over 27 different agencies. So this concludes our presentation. We're available for questions and we thank you for your time. Well, we thank you for not only your time, but your very, very good work. Thank you. Let me do this. Let me see if there are, first of all, questions or comments from council members. Start around this way. We have questions? Yes. Questions, comments? Questions, comments? Ms. Brown is recognized. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. I, um, I've heard these now for, for many years, so it, it's, um, it's really great to see how um, things have evolved and how some of our commitments have been maintained over time. Uh, and uh, my, so my question is uh, actually two questions. One, um, Hera, the, I really like the idea of using these some of these funds for um, housing legal assistance. And I was just wondering, was that a solicited proposal? I'm not familiar with Hera, but I know that the city uh, supports Tenant Sanctuary and other agencies that are part of the Eviction Defense Collaborative here. Um, so just wondering who they are and do they fit with the kind of local com community uh, work that's being done? Um, they weren't a solicited proposal. They are based in Oakland, but they right. do um, serve our community and they do work um, in collaboration with California Rural Legal Assistance, who we have funded previously under our CDBG program, um, but they're not directly affiliated, but they they sometimes, they can provide different variety of services, so they often cross-refer with CRLA and other uh, legal organizations, but they're focusing um, primarily on preventing like homelessness and making sure people aren't being evicted unjustly. I'm all for it. <laughs> so, uh, and my other question is related, good timing on the repayment of the loan, so we do have a significant chunk of funding. Um, is the home set aside, the Chodo set aside, um, that can be used for the um, library project? Just, I I'm, can't totally recall what all of the requirements are there, but I know that it's a, there are some. The, the Downtown Library and Affordable Housing Project is going to be working with a CHODO organization as part of the housing component, so we're able to award our funds. That's right. Thank you. That's right. Thanks for the reminder. Um, thank you very much for this. If I could draw your attention to, I don't know what slide it is for you. For me, it's the this one. <laughs> okay. There we go. Uh, so this says at the top, uh, home program budget it's in green i'll wait until you get there you get yes. there okay good thank you um on the item of home security deposit program did i hear you correctly didn't have a lot of that but you expect a lot more all of a sudden what is that about expecting more yeah so on the demand we, side yes we've been discussing with the housing authority um and they they said they, there's a bit of a slowdown right now just because people aren't moving as much, but they're anticipating it is going to grow based on not only um, some of the trends that they've seen in prior years, but also just like the general um, increase mm -hmm. in, in uh, folks moving around. So they, they are anticipating they'll be able to uh, spend their full amount that they have this year, and they're anticipating that this program will be able to sustain that $80,000 next year. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, your experience with that program so far, uh, when uh, an eligible family or individual says, I need some help with my security deposit, I imagine that ranges all over the place, right? From I need a few hundred dollars to I need several thousand dollars. Is that right? It's situational? Yeah, it's dependent on the unit that they're looking at uh, occupying. If you simply did arithmetic around it we have this many this much money we have this many is that on average uh, three or four thousand uh, dollars help me have a I, bit of a feel for what an average might be yeah i think the housing authority said they would probably average around two thousand or a little bit above per okay. unit so they're estimating like 30 to 35 households okay. to be helped per year 
let me ask if the following is possible. This isn't whether or not you like it. This is whether or not it's possible. Um, it, it, this is in terms of the fungibility of the, of, of, of the funding. If the council said, we're going to be a while on the downtown library, affordable housing, parking, et cetera, there, there's lots of things that come together to make that happen, and a lot of sources also to make that happen. So if we said, rather than $1,675,000, if we said $1,655,000 for that program, that's going to be found someplace else as we move along in life, it seems to me. But on the home security deposit program, if we're going to see an increase, I'd at least be interested in moving 20000 from the affordable housing project to the home security project for this year uh, in the event that you get even more people coming in and, and wanting to deal with that. Because it seems to me that's an immediate issue for people as opposed to we can find another 20,000 in a multi-million dollar project. We'll find that at some point. Is it, so without reference to whether it's a good idea, is that possible for us to do that? If we took an action that adjusted those two, it's okay to spend those dollars that way? Yes, it would be possible if you wanted to adjust the budget recommendation to that today. I will just say it would be worth checking with the housing authority to see if they have capacity to carry out additional um, anticipated. I have checked with one director of, of the housing authority, so I cannot report to you that I have checked with the housing authority in the main, but I've asked one. And the response I got is, it's hard to estimate the level of demand that will be on this. But if we had this much more rather than this much, we got more people we can serve. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be very careful to say that's what I heard as opposed to that's the position of the Housing Authority. Okay. Um, that, uh, that concludes my question. So let me see if there are members of the public who wish to comment on this item. Anyone who is, uh, do we have anyone online, Ms. Bush? Wishes Nobody with their hand raised. Right. Last call for anyone to comment on this item. Mac, matter is back before the council. I'll recognize Council Member Watkins. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, and thank you for the presentation again. I got to see the first one at the Health and All Policies Committee. I really appreciate not having to write a letter um, encouraging support, so <laughs> that's great news as well. I'm comfortable with what you're proposing, Mayor. Um, I don't know if we could frame a motion to incorporate that 20000 to take away from the affordable housing project to incorporate it in the security deposit program, and if the housing authority is unable to carry that out, then that could go back to the affordable housing, given okay. what you said. Does that feel comfortable? So I'm going to see Ms. Bush. I think the motion would be the staff recommendation. Correct. We know what it is. And uh, so the motion would be to amend the staff recommendation on the item relative to the 100% affordable housing project, that that item would be in the amount of $1,655,656. And the motion would continue to say that in the item home security deposit program, that line item would be increased to $100,000. I'll make sure Ms. Bush, and then I need to see if uh, the general lady has a second. Oh, second. There, a, there, there are multiple seconds. <laughs> Ms. Contar Johnson, I'll be right with you to make sure. So I'm going to check with the clerk. We okay? We have the item. All right. You may open on your motion. Yeah, I just want to thank you for the work. I think that's a great suggestion. I think you're absolutely right, and that we'll be able to make that that money up elsewhere and appreciate the work of our, our city staff as well as those who are working in this area to ensure that we can have uh, viable programs available and best use of these fundings. So um, that's, all, that's all I got. Very good. Further on the motion? Yeah. Um, Montari Johnson. I just want to make sure that as part of that motion that if for, uh, the ho um, housing authority is not able to, yeah. right, if, if we captured that piece of it, if they're not able to utilize 
or um, they don't have the capacity to expend those funds, it would be returned to 100% affordable housing. Yeah. Okay, and then I did have a comment. I want to make, make sure that was captured. That, that I tracked that with you, that how we would make that determination is about a year from now, and we would be adjusting some accounts next time you come in front of us based on what the actual right. utilization is, I suspect. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Ms. Contar Johnson. Great, yeah, thank you. I, too, um, saw the first round of this at the Health and All Policies. Um, thank you for your work on this. And I just wanted to acknowledge the, um, the results of the last set of funds and showing what has happened with those dollars, I think it's really helpful for us as council members and the community to see that. Um, and an inquiry as to whether um, these organizations also track um, sort of longer term outcomes and indicators that they connect those numbers to. Well, I don't, I'm not asking that they do more work, but if they do track those, um, you know, serving this many teens has resulted in a, a, an improvement in, in, I don't know, uh, <laughs> increased activity, physical activity, I don't know what, what their indicators are, but if they do track indicators, that would also be great to see for the next round. Thank you. Further questions, comments on the motion? Seeing and hearing none, clerk will call the roll. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion carries and so ordered. What we are going to do is uh, we are going to take a 10 minute break roughly and uh, we will be, let, let me uh, check something. The city attorney just walked out and I was gonna check with him on something. Maybe Mr. Butler, maybe you can help me on this real quickly. The uh, appeal, I wanna make sure that we're not hearing this appeal before people thought we were. Uh, it says here that we would take it up at approximately 3.20 and we are early. So I wanna make sure we are not disadvantaging anyone who thought maybe we wouldn't take this up until 3.20. Uh, thanks for that question, Mayor Keeley. I do see that the two appellants are uh, represented in, uh, uh, two of the appellants, I should say, are represented in the audience. Um, I could pose the question to them whether they're anticipating others. Let's, let's make sure. Are you anticipating ACLG? Yeah. Yeah. Now, I know there's somebody yeah. outside who's I'll repeat that for the members of the public okay. who uh, may not have heard it from the audience. Uh, someone outside is available to comment, but uh, the other appellants from Disability Rights Advocates and uh, ACLU um, are not planning to attend. They're being represented unless they're, they could be online, um, but they're not here in person and they're not, okay, they're not even gonna comment. Um, okay. so, so we're good to go should you okay. choose to do so. Let's do this and uh, we'll just take an eight minute break here. We'll be back at three o'clock and we'll take up the appeal at three o'clock. We stand in recess until such time. After an afternoon recess, the Santa Cruz City Council is back in session. We are on item 20. This is an appeal from the Planning Commission's approval of a coastal permit for continued implementation of the oversized vehicle ordinance in the coastal zone. We will hear first a staff presentation, then the appellant, Mr. Meisler, will have up to 20 minutes to present his appeal. There will then be questions from staff, public comments, um, and uh, Mr. Miser will then be given five minutes to rebut any items that have been raised. And uh, we will then have the matter back before the body for a decision. We will start uh, with Mr. Mayor and with Mr. Butler. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Welcome. Good afternoon.
Good afternoon, Mayor Kaylee and members of the City Council. My name is Tim Mayer, Senior Planner with the City. Uh, the current agenda item is consideration of an appeal of the Planning Commission's approval of a coastal permit to allow for ongoing implementation of the City's oversized vehicle ordinance within the coastal zone. The application under consideration is an appeal of the Planning Commission's decision made February 1st of this year to approve a coastal permit allowing ongoing implementation of the City's oversized vehicle ordinance or OVO and safe parking program. Approval of the coastal permit was required as follow-up to the California Coastal Commission or CCC's one-year approval of the existing coastal development permit set to expire on May 11th of 2024. Denial of the appeal would allow the Planning Commission's approval to remain in effect and authorize ongoing implementation of the city's oversized vehicle ordinance as adopted by ordinance number 2021-20 and later amended by ordinance number 2023-08. Among other elements, the existing regulations prohibit parking citywide of oversized vehicles or OVs on city streets between the hours of midnight or 12 a.m. and 5 a.m. It also prohibit parking of unattached trailers and facilitate the city's safe parking program. The approval of the coastal permit also accommodates potential future minor modifications to the city's safe parking program and oversized vehicle ordinance regulations, including, for example, potential revisions to its OV residential parking permit program. The oversized vehicle ordinance applies citywide. Here, the red dashed border you can see on the screen indicates the limits of the city of Santa Cruz, and the solid purple line represents the border of the coastal zone, the northerly border, that is. Uh, the yellow areas of this map show the portions of land within the limits of the city of Santa Cruz which fall within the coastal zone. As visible in this image, many of the um, street segments available for public parking do allow for direct access to the coast. For over a decade, the city has pursued efforts aimed at attempting to alleviate the sometimes adverse impacts of long-term parking of oversized vehicles. Through the OV and associated programs, the city aims to balance the community concerns expressed regarding the effects of long-term static parking of oversized vehicles with the protection of potentially vulnerable individuals, including occupants of oversized vehicles who may have limited access to housing. The actions approved by the Planning Commission on February the 1st include the limitation of parking of oversized vehicles, as I mentioned, between the hours of midnight and 5 a.m., uh, seeking to reduce the impacts of parking of oversized vehicles in public rights of way. Oversized vehicles are defined as motor vehicles exceeding 20 feet in length or 8 feet in height and 7 feet in width. The city's oversized vehicle ordinance is codified in the city's municipal code primarily in Title 10, Section 4, but also includes Municipal Code Section 1619.070. This afternoon's hearing represents the 12th public hearing related to the topic of regulation of parking of oversized vehicles on city rights away, a number which includes 10 city public hearings and two hearings of the California Coastal Commission. The first version of the OVO was adopted in 2015. Since that time, numerous actions have been taken and hearings held, providing ample opportunity for expression and collection of public feedback, which has led to ongoing refinement of regulations leading to today's hearing. The city has invested hundreds, likely thousands of hours of staff time with representatives of all city departments participating in these efforts in an exhaustive campaign to address the needs of those dwelling in oversized vehicles and the process creating a program unique to the city of Santa Cruz. Staff would like to acknowledge the tireless work of the members of the city's oversized vehicle subcommittee, including council members Bruner, Golder, and Kalantari Johnson, who have provided guidance instrumental in these efforts. Documents attached to the staff report for this afternoon's item provide detailed background information demonstrating the expansive measures taken by the city aimed at making progress toward resolving the crisis of homelessness and in particular in addressing the long duration parking of oversized vehicles. At the May 11th, 2023 hearing, the California Coastal Commission stipulated a number of conditions of approval required for renewal of the city's coastal development permit. Although approved in May of 2023, the city made changes to the ordinance to ameliorate concerns of the California Coastal Commission and affect the CCC's intent, and the ordinance in its current form became effective in June of 2023. As part of the one-year authorization of the city's coastal development permit, Many conditions of approval were imposed by the California Coastal Commission, prompting the city to launch a range of initiatives and prepare and implement a number of programs within this past year. Over the year, city staff have prepared and launched an outreach plan 
building on past efforts and tailored to address the needs of dwellers of oversized vehicles. Staff additionally prepared a communication and outreach plan to affect community outreach efforts related to OV regulations and programs. City staff have also implemented an oversized vehicle ordinance signage plan, including all parameters specified in the CDP conditions of approval. Installation of signage began in November of 2023 and was completed prior to the city's first day of enforcement of the OVO on December the 4th of 2023. The city has additionally initiated an OVO operations and management plan detailing the manner in which the oversized vehicle ordinance would be facilitated and the safe parking program conducted. In accordance with Coastal Development Permit Condition of Approval Number 6, the City has also formed a 10-member stakeholder group um, with approximately equal representation by members of various unhoused advocates and oversized vehicle parking control advocates tasked with shaping City policy related to the OVO and Safe Parking Program. For the process of review of the um, Coastal Permit applications, staff have received a range of feedback uh, both from members of the public and from members of the stakeholder group related to implementation of the OVO. The stakeholder group has convened on five separate occasions, exceeding the uh, minimum of four meetings set by the California Coastal Commission and providing an opportunity for provision of feedback related to the OVO and safe parking program, guide their implementation and effect imp improvements as necessary. As part of the coastal permit approved by the Planning Commission at the February 1st hearing, City staff have collected feedback expressed by the stakeholder group and members of the public and fashioned several conditions of approval. The first new condition of approval um, entitled by the Planning Commission on February the 1st would provide a mechanism for ongoing collection of public feedback, which would be provided to Coastal Commission staff upon request, allowing for ongoing review of success of the safe parking program. In another condition, the city voluntarily imposed a five-year limit uh, of time on its coastal permit to provide a mechanism for review of program success by the planning director and California Coastal Commission executive director, affording the opportunity for updates as necessary. A separate condition of approval um, requires that the city conduct an OV count on an annual basis. Another, that the staff proactively solicit feedback from potential enrollees in the safe parking program, again, offering an opportunity for them to offer feedback regarding improvements to the parking program and to identify services that would provide assistance and further that the city collect quantitative uh, as well as qualitative data which will assist in assessment of the effectiveness of the oversized vehicle ordinance and safe parking program and alleviating adverse environmental and health and safety impacts of entrenchment of oversized vehicles. As requested by the appellants during the stakeholder group sessions, the city's OVO website has also been updated to more prominently exhibit the option for request of reasonable accommodations to the OVO and safe parking program available to those with documented disabilities. On February 9th, the, the appellant submitted a letter to the city contesting the Planning Commission's decision to approve the coastal permit required for removal uh, of the city's one year, excuse me, renewal of the city's one year CDP. The letter of appeal submitted by the appellant includes two primary arguments, each with multiple parts. Essentially, the appellants argue that the city's move to extend the OVO pilot program is premature and that the program violates provisions of the city's general plan. Uh, in sum, the claims made by the appellant contain no new information not previously addressed and or rebutted. The appellant submitted requested conditions of approval on March the 7th, the evening before the publication deadline for the agenda packet. Several of the appellant's requests such as the city's subsidizing of fuel for OV dwellers and allowance of unfettered parking of unattached tra trailers on city streets uh, constitutes <clears throat> excuse me, unreasonable demands which cannot realistically be accommodated. The city's safe parking program supplies parking capacity for oversized vehicles and lots through a supervised environment sponsored and managed by the city located on city owned or operated facilities. Six lots are currently open for provision of safe parking, providing adequate availability of parking spaces to the, meet the present demand. Additional lots can be activated to accommodate potential future capacity needs. The city is affirmatively committed to accommodating safe parking for all participants who request access to emergency overnight and overnight only programs. This parking and the associated trash, restroom, and hand washing services are provided free of charge to OV dwellers and their vehicles. Further, the city continues to provide its 24-7 safe parking program located at the National Guard Armory 
in Upper De La Viega Park, affording participants with designated parking spaces available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, along with wraparound or comprehensive support services. Feedback provided from Safe Parking Program participants has cited the challenge associated with paying for fuel ne necessary for relocation for Safe Parking Program uh, facilities to daytime parking locations. It's notable that thousands of parking locations are available within approximately a mile of safe parking facility spaces, many with access to the coast, thereby minimizing travel distances for OV dwellers who relocate during the day. This slide presents information regarding the number of oversized vehicle parking permits and citations for violations of the OVO issued to date. As of two days ago, 297 citations or parking tickets have been issued. Nearly half of those have been reduced to warnings as first time violations with others having been successfully appealed. According to information provided by enforcement officers, approximately half the citations were issued in the first several days following initiation of enforcement, which began on December 4th of 2023. The overall trend toward declining citation issuance over time indicates a growing public awareness of the program and increasing compliance with overnight parking restrictions. To date, no vehicle in the city has been towed for having accumulated five or more citations resulting from violations of the OVO. This slide shows the location in which citations resulting from violation of the oversized vehicle ordinance have been issued. As demonstrated in this map, citations have been issued equitably throughout the city. Greater numbers of citations have been issued in select locations due to the higher concentration of oversized vehicles which have cited over time in the specific areas of the city. Information available to city staff reveals that the OVO and associated safe parking program implementation have resulted in positive environmental outcomes and public access benefits. City staff have received feedback from members of the public, including OVO advocate participants of the stakeholder outreach group that overall OV entrenchment has diminished and impacts associated with long-term OV stays in areas such as Delaware Avenue where OV entrenchment was previously common and where environmentally sensitive habitat for 12 documented environmental uh, species is abundant have significantly diminished. Council members of the OVO subcommittee have received similar reports from their constituents. A reduction in long-term stays by oversized vehicles together with improved access by OV dwellers to proper hygiene and trash disposal facilities via the city's safe parking program has led to observations of decreased trash accumulation and diminished prevalence of outdoor disposal of untreated human waste among others, including areas near sensitive habitats such as Antonelli Pond, again, where OV entrenchment and incidents of outdoor restroom use were common prior to OVO implementation. Data collected by homelessness response field crews who regularly patrol areas frequented by the unhoused, including dwellers of over oversized vehicles, indicates a full 48% decline in the amount of trash hauled away since the beginning of enforcement of the OVO. Again, corroborating anecdotal reports of the success of enforcement efforts and benefits to environmentally sensitive areas. Those observations represent reasonably anticipated outcomes of implementation of the city's safe parking program and enforcement of a prohibition and overnight parking of oversized vehicles and public rights away between midnight and 5 a.m. Um, on March the 7th, the appellant, the appellants sent correspondence, including a number of requests for revisions and additions to project conditions of approval. The complete list of requested conditions was included as an attachment to the staff report. Uh, those requesting conditions, which can be realistically accommodated, are listed on this slide and the next several slides for the council's consideration. So here's the first of several uh, recommended conditions of approval that have been added since uh, the, uh, the packet was published. Happy to read that if helpful. Okay, so the first of uh, several recommended conditions of approval, um, OVO outreach documents, including the city's website regarding the oversized vehicle ordinance, shall indicate the following. Oversized vehicle ordinance, or excuse me, oversized, oversized vehicle overnight parking space is available. If oversized vehicle overnight parking space fills up, eligible applicants will be given an on-street permit which will protect the vehicle from being ticketed under SCMC 10.40.120A, which is the prohibition against oversized vehicles on street parking from midnight to 5 a.m. If I just add one thing, um, 
Thank you, Mayor Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development. Um, one of the things we heard from the stakeholders was that um, individuals who are unhoused receive a lot of paperwork and aren't always, um, uh, they might get something about a program and their uh, success rate in finding that uh, program having availability is slim. And so that was a, a statement that resonated with us and something that we wanted to address as part of this to make it clear that that there is space available in these uh, programs so that when they get that flyer, it um, it has a little bit more weight, perhaps, than some of the things that they have received in the past. So that was part of the intent behind this. Thank you. The second and third uh, recommended conditions of approval to be added include the following. Uh, continue to maintain an easily, uh, <clears throat> easily access disability grievance slash reasonable accommodation process to consider reasonable accommodations for those with disabilities. Another that motorized vehicles with attached trailers are eligible for participation in the tier two, which is the uh, 30 day overnight safe parking program. And I will just add there um, that those vehicles are already um, able to participate in the overnight only and and uh, we would actually change that we've we've moved away from the tier system um, uh, although we accidentally left it on the slide here and so that should say um, overnight only uh, parking program uh, I just wanted to make sure that um, everyone was aware we already allow for um, motorized vehicles with attached trailers and have had um, participants that um, are in that position um, in the uh, overnight only program. And a couple of more here. Um, the OVO website and the outreach materials or tickets themselves will include information identifying that payment plans are available for OVO tickets. Also, the city shall conduct proactive outreach to those living in oversized vehicles, including number one, provision of information regarding the city's safe parking programs and how to register. And number two, the manner by which one may submit a disability accommodation request to the city. Okay. So overall, the claims of the appellants in, cont in contesting the Planning Commission's approval of the city's coastal permit, which is necessary for continued implementation of the OVO and safe parking program, lack merit and introduce no substantive arguments not already addressed in prior review and through existing city plans and documents. Staff recommend that the City Council deny the appeal and uphold the decision of the Planning Commission to approve the Coastal Permit with recommended conditions of approval, including those added here, authorizing the City to continue implementation of Ordinance Number 2021-20 as amended by Ordinance 2023-08 and as enumerated in the Municipal Code, provide for continued operation of the Safe Parking Program and accommodate potential future minor modifications to the City's Safe Parking Program and oversized vehicle regulations, such as future revisions to the OV residential parking permit program. Staff are available to answer questions related to any topic discussed and to provide additional information as needed. Thank you very much. This concludes staff presentation. Well, thank you very much, sir. We uh, now give the opportunity to the appellant to uh, make your presentation. And Mr. Meisler is recognized. Uh, Joy and I are actually going to split this a little bit. The right additional information is needed. Thank you very much. This concludes staff presentation. Well, thank you very much, sir. We uh, now so, give the opportunity to the oh, appellant did you to uh, it? make your presentation. And Mr. Meisler is recognized. I don't think that's coming from me. <laughs> Not me. Yeah, uh, Joy and I are actually going to split this a little bit. The right additional information is needed. Thank you very much. This concludes staff presentation. Thank you very much, sir. Give us a second here to get sure, together. Sure, no problem. All right. We good to go? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, 
The appellant, your time will start now. Good afternoon, Mayor Keeley, council members and staff. Thank you for hearing our appeal today. Give Santa us a second here to get started. Sure, ready. no problem. All right. We're good to go? Okay. okay. Uh, the appellant, your time will start now. Oh, okay. All right, thank you. Uh, Santa Cruz Cares the American Civil Liberties Union and disability rights advocates have been collaborating on monitoring the rollout of the oversized vehicle and uh, ordinance enforcement and have participated in good faith in the stakeholder meetings. Additionally, we have spent hours of our own time and coordinated other volunteers to conduct point in time counts of vehicles likely to be affected by OVO and canvassing vehicular residents in the coastal zone. We are not just two people here today to appeal this new five-year OVO permit. We have the backing of hundreds of local residents, including people with lived experience of ve vehicular dwelling and houselessness. The ACLU and disability rights advocates are nationally respected organizations with legal expertise and thousands of their own members. OVO proponents continue to overstate the harm done by vehicular dwellers in general, while minimizing pragmatic and affordable solutions supported by advocates, those with lived experience, and research-backed best practices. Instead of working productively and inclusively to resolve conflict, the entire populace and visitors to our town have been restricted. We continue to oppose the oversized vehicle ordinance because we believe that it has been fundamentally flawed from the start and that, that this new permit with minor modifications remains fundamentally flawed. It violates civil rights and disability rights and disproportionately impacts a frontline community, one that our city has committed to protecting in other resolutions and policies. We believe it, uh, it is our ethical duty to fight with and for those who have the least and are most discriminated against. That's why we're here today. In the agenda item, there should be the appellant permit conditions, and we don't need to pull those up right now, but uh, if we could have them ready uh, to pull up, that would be great. And um, I will pass it back to Reggie now. We'll, we'll be alternating. All right. Uh, so I think it's worth noting uh, through this process that we had 10 OVO stakeholders in the stakeholder committee, but actually only one of those stakeholders was a person living in a vehicle who was made vulnerable to citation by OVO. The other person living in a vehicle was in tier three. And so no one else was really negatively impacted by OVO. And therefore, uh, there was a really imbalanced sort of set of interest groups. Um, that stakeholder's name, by the way, is Jamie. She wrote a lengthy letter about her experience of the stakeholder process and OVO. A letter, which as far as I can tell, was omitted from your packet tonight. Jamie had felt silenced and intimidated by the stakeholder process. For this reason, I would like to center some of what she said for a bit so you can hear uh, in her own words what she uh, felt she experienced. I am exhausted all the time. Life for people who are working and trying to better their situation is made harder by the OVO. You can't sleep well for fear of oversleeping and getting more tickets. You can't enjoy a late night out or a night away because the RV has to be moved. Panic sets in at any sign of a maintenance problem. Twice a day, everything has to be secured for the move. One of the RVs in Tier 2 safe parking belongs to a single father with a baby. He told me he received a ticket the morning after staying there because he didn't relocate from the Tier 2 lot before the morning deadline. He said it was just after 8 a.m. and his son was still sleeping in bed. He told this to the parking enforcer, and the parking enforcer told him he needed to move now and did not even give him time to get his baby into a car seat 
he told him, just drive slowly. The parking enforcer then started counting how many parking spaces he was taking up, threatening to ticket him for each parking space, that if he did not move, he was at risk of getting kicked out of the safe parking program. He told me he received four parking tickets since he started using Tier 2, and he fears that this excessive ticketing will result in his RV being towed. In just the past few months, I have witnessed numerous RVs being towed away, leaving people on the side of the road with their belongings, often in tears and losing hope. The behavior of some police officers was unprofessional and malicious. I witnessed officers standing around laughing and making jokes as people's homes were getting towed away. I have yet to hear of anyone being given information about available resources. This process has left many in difficult situations. So city staff responded to Jamie's letter, but unfortunately their response did not show concern or interest in investigation. They simply directed Jamie how to go online and submit formal complaints about these various departments, which you can't do online, you have to do it by mail, you have to do it in person. These are not easy complaints to submit. What Jamie was effectively providing city staff was an on-the-ground report by an OVO stakeholder of how people living in vehicles were experiencing the OVO and Tier 2 safe parking. This, again, was the only stakeholder who actually was negatively impacted by the OVO. And yet, not one word of what Jamie wrote was echoed during the Planning Commission public hearing by the commissioners and not by city staff. And yet, the permit conditions and the permit was approved. It was as if she never wrote this letter at all. Jamie was right to feel dismissed and ignored by this process. It's hard to imagine responding in a more disempowering, uncaring way toward what, frankly, should have been a shocking set of stories of abuse directed at people who are just trying to participate in good faith in tier two safe parking. So with that added context, uh, can we bring up the permit conditions that uh, the appellants are, that we're trying to offer here? Uh, yes, just one second, please. I'm, I'm not going to like go through each one. Oh, okay. right. Ms. Bush, can we stop the clock for a second here for the gentleman? Is, We're not going to take this out of your time, Mr. Meisner. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know how clearly you guys can see that. You can see that. Yeah, so. We'll, we'll restart the clock. Go ahead. Thank you. So we appreciate um, that some of these permit conditions were mentioned today by city staff and um, brought into their recommendations. Um, we think that there are a few on here that are worth calling out that were not sort of brought in. One was um, the permit condition number two, which is that tier two is a registration-based safe parking service, but the registration phone number is only available nine to five on weekdays. So if I call 5 p.m. any given weekday, it's already too late. I'm going to get ticketed later that night. If I call 5 p.m. on Friday, I could get ticketed three days in a row and accrue $150 in fines by the time I get registered. We think that permit condition number two is very important for ensuring that tier two is uh, implemented fairly and within the interests of people who are living in vehicles. Now, the um, permit condition number three is particularly important because of the history of this struggle. Uh, the city manager, as you might remember, 
uh, as we challenged the unpermitted no overnight parking signs on the far west side, attempted to use an old permit from 2016 to restripe all of the parking spaces, unlike Delaware Avenue, Natural Bridges, Mission Street Extension, to be too small for oversized vehicles. We don't want to have to deal with that problem, particularly when we're already asking people to relocate. We don't want to take away their daytime parking. So we think that this is a non-negotiable uh, permit condition. Um, and permit condition number four may seem a little excessive. Uh, safe parking program vehicles who get a breakdown in the process of participating have a grace period. But one of the primary issues that gets people towed is that frequent uh, relocation causes vehicle breakdowns. And so if this is produced in uh, people who are participating in good faith in the tier two program, a lot of people who have breakdowns, they do their own maintenance, they can fix their vehicle within like a week, two weeks to at least be able to relocate once or twice. Um, and so this, this may feel a little excessive, maybe we can play with the timeline, but uh, because of how tier two causes constant relocation every day, it does seem fairly important as a safety net for folks. Uh, so for number five, that was added, we appreciate that. Uh, number six, no timeline for participants, time limit. I think, I don't know if that was the case, it seemed like we, we still have that 30 day window, but I think that like, 30 days is, you know, these people are chronically living in their vehicle. I don't think 30 days really makes sense, so I think item number six is really important. If we can scroll down to uh, some of the later conditions here. Uh, I think seven was somewhat addressed, um, but I think uh, some of these details uh, are pretty important to us. Uh, if we can go down to eight. Uh, so the thing with eight is that when we originally came up with OVO, part of what mitigated environmental impacts was the idea that people had a way to do mobile dumping. And if we don't have that, then you're really kind of sacrificing what OVO is supposed to be about in the first place. So it seems like this would be pretty helpful just for, from your guys' perspective, honestly. Um, number nine, I definitely didn't see number nine in the uh, conditions that are recommended. I think that if somebody has a disability placard and disability license plate, this is really important. Uh, can we keep going down here? Now, number 11. The city explicitly said, city staff said they did not want to do this. What we're talking about right now, in terms of the raw number of people, is we have, what, 30 participants? $200 a month, that's less than $100,000. I think that, like, to help people, to make this a truly cost-free program, which is what the permit conditions suggest is necessary for OVO, this is not a big expense to uh, sort of fulfill that burden. And people spend probably more than $200 a month. So it's, uh, I would say like, this isn't as scary and as big a deal as maybe city staff is making it out to be. It's a somewhat reasonable condition, I would say. Now number 12, this I think is very important. <laughs> And the, to me, this is non-negotiable as well. If we're going to be doing OVO and displacing people during the night, we cannot also engage in this discriminatory street sweeping, which seems redundant, honestly. Like hundreds of emails are saying that there is no debris problem on Delaware Avenue, natural bridges, Mission Street extension, now that OVO is enforced. 
And yet Transportation Public Works Commission is implementing this discriminatory street sweeping with tow-away signs that are permanently installed in these coastal areas. So we need to call this what it is. This is like adding anti-houselessness on top of OVO. And this is non-negotiable. Um, and so I think I've gone through sort of what I want to go through. Um, and I just want to sort of make it clear that we're trying to do this in good faith. These permit conditions are what we consider collectively enough such that we will not appeal to the Coastal Commission. And I think that that's like a pretty big offering, you know? Like we could appeal to the Coastal Commission and then we could appeal street sweeping to the Coastal Commission and then we could appeal uh, the sort of restriping of natural bridges in the bike lane or whatever to the Coastal Commission. This is gonna save you guys a lot of time and money if you can just agree to this here and, and uh, we can call it kind of a truce. Um, so, do you have anything else you wanna say? Let me check time on this. Uh, 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 Ms. Bush or Ms. Wood, do we have a, uh, how much time has the gentleman got remaining? Four minutes. Four minutes, just to help you out on that. Yeah, I think I've said basically what I wanna say. Okay. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Let me see if uh, council members have questions of staff. Anybody? Okay. I'll start over here, Ms. Brunner. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah. Uh, Sandy. Uh, thank you to staff and the appellants um, for bringing up uh, some of the conditions. And I just wanted to ask staff on the conditions that the appellant called out, if you could speak to um, 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, 9, 11, and 12. Okay, with that, you're in charge. Thank you for that opportunity, Councilmember Berner. I had Thank you. flagged each one of those. Um, so if you can highlight those conditions um, as I am speaking to them. Um, Number two was the first one was the yep. phone number Thank and the you. voicemail yes. Monday through Friday yep. nine to five. Got it. So um, we talked about this, um, and uh, we have established mechanisms in place right now to inform people where they can go. Um, if someone were to receive a ticket, then they uh, have the information on the ticket with respect to the safe parking registration. That first ticket is also waived, as the council is aware. And um, right now, very few tickets are being issued. Um, but I think most importantly, um, we did confirm that the voicemail where the um, with the phone number is being checked on the weekends. And so the individual is actually responding to people on the weekends if they are getting those calls. And so um, we believe we have uh, adequately addressed that through our current uh, operational um, approach. And um, we can continue to assess um, how best to address that as, as additional needs arise, but we think that we're addressing it through our current process. Um, on number can three. I, can I ask a question please. about that? Yeah, yeah, please. So if someone's looking for a safe parking overnight, tier two, yes. uh, and they call that number and it goes to voicemail, does the voicemail instruct to leave a message and someone will check, leave your information, and how will they know that they won't get a ticket or where to go? It all explains that in the voicemail. I'll have to, I'll have to, I, on the voicemail, it just asks for a message. Okay. And if you're leaving that message, then um, that message is getting returned, including on weekends, um, the individual who uh, monitors, who uh, whose voicemail that is, did indicate that she is checking it on weekends and responding on weekends. To okay, that's, that's good to know. I just, I, I wonder if we could, 
add to the voicemail that please, you know, make it very clear that there's, here's the process. You leave your information, voicemail, it will be checked after hours, weekends, and you will not be subject to a ticket in this circumstance or how to register. We would update the voicemail to identify that uh, how folks can register and that they can um, uh, leave a voicemail and that that um, will be monitored so that um, the directions for uh, going to the correct safe parking location um, can be provided as part of that return call. That's an, that's an easy fix. Thank you. Of course. Um, number three, um, <clears throat> this uh, is, uh, as is the case with um, number 12, um, so if you want to scroll to both of those, number three and number 12 are both issues that are subject to um, separate coastal permits, and such coastal permits will be evaluated on their merits when um, they, if and when they proceed. Um, the permit in front of you uh, should not preclude any future actions, and that's that's what the request of the appellant is. It's it would preclude future actions that um, may or not be may or may not be related at all to oversized vehicles. Um, that um, uh, that is a separate coastal permit, and. Um, they would be evaluated through that separate coastal permit. Um, so we're not recommending any conditions um, related to that. Um, the next one on the list was uh, number four. <clears throat> number four. Um, so this is related to a, a six-month grace period for anyone who has a, a breakdown. Um, we have a provision in the code um, that allows for a 24-hour period. Um, and I will say that is a, a minimum in terms of how that has been addressed. Um, there is um, at least one instance um, where the um, where a breakdown has occurred and um, the police uh, were in contact with that individual and offered they had a week to um, to get their vehicle, you know, the police were very flexible, they were understanding, and the police are the ones that are out there giving the tickets. And so um, I think the way that we approach the situation is um, with uh, flexibility so that um, those specific situations can be addressed um, and that the individual's um, circumstances can be taken into account. The next one on the list was number six, um, and that is um, no time limit for um, overnight parking. Um, I wanted to point out that we have been running this program for over two years, and we have never denied an extension, nor have we kicked anyone out of this program. That said, we can't anticipate um, changes in the future, and we're not recommending an indefinite timeline at this point, given those long-term uncertainties. Um, but I think our record stands for itself that in the two years, we've been able to accommodate everyone, and we have not um, had to uh, implement any type of time restrictions on the program. Remind me, is it 30 days? It's 30 days, and then it's renewed every 30 days. And so every renewal um, request has been accommodated. And how many renewal requests have we received? OK, I, I, I was going to venture a guess, but um, our team is pulling that information. And, and we'll go back to that in just Thank a few you. minutes. And um, I would just note, um, Gavin, if you're pulling that information from your team, there were also extended periods of time before parking was handling that, that um, the homelessness response team was addressing those renewals. So Larry, you might have an idea on that, and then you can add that to Gavin's data. Sorry. 
Thank coordination, you. live I, coordination. Yeah. Um, okay, um, let's see, that was number six. Next up is number eight. Um, number eight was the um, mobile, dumping. mobile dumping station. Um, so we are working on a location for a mobile dumping. Um, uh, we um, are still looking at um, where that can be. We, we do have some money that we are anticipating um, dedicating towards that, but um, we're still working on the siting of that. It is something that is of interest to us. Um, we also do not believe it should be a condition of approval as requiring uh, of this uh, of this oversized vehicle ordinance implementation and the coastal permit that's associated. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Larry. Molly is recognized. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. So according to our data, there's been 32 renewals for the overnight safe parking program. And that formalized process began after enforcement began in December. So the first set of renewals for the 30-day period was actually a 45-day period. So it was the middle of January. It was the first round of renewals for participants in the program. So that's been happening for now two plus almost three months. Thank you so much. And um, just so we're 100% clear, that does not include the first, uh, what, 20 months of implementation. And we did have individuals that had renewed um, continuously uh, during that time or, or from var for various periods during that time. So that's the stat just for um, post-OVO implementation. Um, Okay, uh, we were on number eight, and we are on to number nine. Um, the Can I go back to yes, eight please, really yeah, quick? Yes, please, yeah, um, I know it's in, um, as part of the overall OVO um, with this mobile, can you, is there, um, what is in that process that you can speak to in terms of the process of finding a location, the funding. Um, I know we briefly touched on it, but ran out of time. Yes, so um, there are several things that are taken into account. Um, nearby uses um, and um, the uh, right-of-way and how the right-of-way can accommodate the, um, the circulation of both the oversized vehicle um, that would be stopping and utilizing the dump station, as well as any potential queuing that may be necessary for that oversized vehicle and ensuring that that does not impact um, circulation. Um, and so those are some of the, the key things that the team is looking at right now in terms of where um, the, the location of the um, dumping station could be. Thank you. Of course. Um, on to number nine. Um, number nine um, was related to um, accessibility and those with uh, disabled uh, placards. And I um, want to point out here that when parking outside of a safe parking lot, um, the ADA placard is valid at metered spaces or uh, permit required areas with no exceptions. So um, areas where there's a parking permit required, for example. Um, those with an accessible placard can park in those areas and there are no costs to that. So you don't need to have a, a permit to park in a hourly parking uh, area. You know, if it says, you know, no parking except by permit for um, a specific area, people with disabled placards can park in those areas. And so that is already accommodated and that is a part of the um, California Vehicle Code. Let's see, um, number 11 was next, uh, the um, monthly gas cards and um, the subsidization of fuel bills to private parties um, is outside of the scope of the safe parking program. Um, we do not have the funding for this. The appellant mentioned that is $100,000 per year, and um, that is a 
a substantial expense. Um, we, as you know, um, spend about $620,000 per year on our uh, various safe parking programs, and that would be a, a significant expense above and beyond that. Um, so that, uh, we already covered number 12. We, we lumped that in with, I think it was number two. Um, so I wanted to just um, note that we took um, these comments very, very seriously. Um, and as you can tell, you know, we talked about every single one of them. Um, we gave them all very careful consideration, as we have with all of the feedback that we've received from the stakeholder group and others. And um, we did incorporate conditions um, that stemmed from these comments um, and suggested conditions. Um, you know, we did not include all of them. We did not think that, um, that all of them were um, the right fit for, for this particular coastal permit. Um, and you know, it is within the, the council's purview to add or uh, to add any of these conditions or to modify the conditions that we added in response to this. But we um, have included only those conditions that we feel uh, address the comments um, that um, are pertinent to the operation. Um, and if it pleases the mayor, I would like to respond to one other comment that the appellants made um, with respect to um, the member of the stakeholder group that um, provided feedback at the planning commission. Um, I wanted to note two things. Um, one, a link to the planning commission packet um, was provided to the council. Um, we did not reiterate all of those materials back over, but we did um, uh, provide that link and noted that information was available. And that, that information is posted as part of the Planning Commission packet. And specifically, you know, the appellant referred to um, the city's response to that. I wanted to note that we um, did take that, that letter very seriously, just as we did others. In fact, we took it so seriously that we wrote an entire response directly related to it and um, posted that as part of the Planning Commission packet. So I just wanted to make sure that, um, that all those listening are aware that we are um, taking that feedback seriously. We are looking to accommodate um, uh, changes to the program where um, we can, and we're looking to um, implement something that, that works for a broad range of stakeholders. Council Member? Uh that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gallandar Johnson is recognized. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you for going over those conditions. I had questions about some of them. You've answered. But I just want to confirm that what I heard is that um, these are either already in place, have been incorporated, or working on it, or a couple of them are infeasible. That's sort of the synthesis of what I got from your responses to each of those conditions. That's correct. We. Uh, we do have some where we um, modified the language, right? We said, mm -hmm. you know, this is this is addressing what they identified, but not in the, the same manner. Um, and other things, you know, like it's not six months of a, a person at the table, right. but our police department and enforcing the regulations is, is applying flexibility in how they um, handle their work. Thank you. Um, now, the stakeholder group, which met more than the number of times that was required by the Coastal Commission, um, have they seen these conditions of, of um, approval that, that are put forward by the appellant, and have they weighed in, the members of the stakeholder group? The, the um, conditions that were suggested by the appellant came um, last Wednesday evening, uh -huh. and so the stakeholder group, the last meeting was uh, two weeks ago. Um, so the stakeholder group as a whole has not weighed in on those conditions. Um, we did post them. Um, I didn't see any members of the stakeholder group that specifically commented on them as part of the public comment. So I think that's an important piece of information that the larger group that's been really engaged and involved over the last year has not um, had the opportunity to weigh in. Um, I see that, yeah. I, I, I would just add one thing, um, which is that, you know, some of the things, for example, the, the first thing that I mentioned um, when we were talking about the added conditions of approval, where um, we said um, we will add, um, I'm going to have to go back to it. What was the first condition? Oh. Oh, yeah. Thank you. 
things. Yeah, the um, it was um, putting on the uh, materials that um, you know, there is space available. Um, you know, that was a conversation. Thanks for sharing that. That was a conversation that um, took place in the uh, stakeholder group meeting. And so I don't want to say that sure. none of these things were discussed, um, but the specific wording of the language um, and the proposed conditions um, that was provided um, just last week. Sure. And then, um, one last question for now. Um, I see that staff recommendation is for the continuation of the stakeholder group. Uh, I believe it was twice a year over the next couple of years. Uh, I can't remember the details right now, um, which is great. I'm glad to see that we are committing or there, there's a recommendation to commit to continue uh, this level of engagement. Um, the question is, will the makeup of this, is, is the proposal of the makeup of the stakeholder group remain the same in terms of sort of the representation of those seats, not, not the exact people, because I know that could shift. That's a great question. And um, yes, and uh, yes, we are anticipating that the representation will remain generally the same. And we do expect that the individuals may shift. And um, we have a provision in a, a condition of approval before you that um, allows for us to go to the Coastal Commission Executive Director who has um, approved our outreach and stakeholder plans. Mm -hmm. And if we want to, for example, uh, tweak the membership, um, then there's a process by which we can do that. But at this point, we're just anticipating that the individuals would shift, we, but we have the flexibility to make that uh, shift in the future. Great, those are my questions for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Brown is recognized. Thank you. Um, let's see, I, well, I have a bunch of questions, but I'm going to try to consolidate them so as not to belabor this. Um, so I, I guess I'll start by saying I understand the, the city is lining up the steps to ensure timely renewal. And so in the, the two uh, areas of concern in the appeal, the, the timeliness question, you've, you've responded to that. Um, however, I also see some merit in the appellants, uh, and they really make a fair point, I guess, that the, uh, of concern that the city has not really um, meaningfully reviewed the impacts of the OVO um, on unhoused people. And so I'm thinking in particular about um, things like um, no toes, right? So I guess I, I, things that have not yet happened, um, we're hearing there's flexibility and we're giving people extra time um, if they need it to move their vehicles. It's not, that's not codified, that's not required. We don't know how often um, police officers are not offering that amount of time um, versus are offering that amount of time. It feels to me like if there's a problem there that that should be further analyzed and there should be some way to address that. Um, I, I'm just not comfortable with um, promoting selective enforcement ever <laughs> in, in any um, kind of government function, regulatory function. So um, just kind of I think there's some real merit there, and I, I guess I would ask um, how you see, uh, you know, because being nimble can can provide an opportunity, but it can also foreclose an opportunity. And so, how you see, um, just I guess that flexibility is just totally contingent. And so, why wouldn't we want to put some kind of safeguard in there about? the one, the amount of time that people have to um, address concerns with their vehicle. I mean, I think 24 hours is just, and I've said this before, is not enough time. I'd like to see um, more time there. Um, if we, if the council rejects that additional condition, at a minimum, it feels like it would be helpful to have some time, a week, I don't know what would be more reasonable. I mean, under-resourced people are, are that, that, that challenge isn't going to go away, but at least giving people time when they're in crisis um, feels like it would, would be um, compassionate and a, a, based on what I'm hearing, codify current practice um, because you're telling us that the police do give more time. So um, I'd like to see a week. What do you, what, is that 
or in your perspective, how would that work for you all to codify that? Um, so a couple of things. Um, it's certainly within the council's authority to um, add a condition that would um, extend that um, code required 24 hours to a longer period of time for vehicles that are inoperable. Um, and um, the, uh, I, I want to also address the, the issue of towing. Um, That's my next question, so yeah. <laughs> go for it. <laughs> yeah, because you mentioned that as part of this in terms of like a potential concern about towing. Um, the the um, city's even ability to tow based just on um, the uh, oversized vehicle ordinance is um, limited. We um, would have to go and get, if, if you had five tickets, it used to be, that um, once you had um, more than five tickets, um, that vehicle could be towed. Now, um, if you get more than five tickets, that um, that can't automatically trigger a tow. It would have to um, it, it would have to come with a judge's order. Um, and so, you know, the the threat of tow is separate from the um, uh, the just the timing of, of getting another ticket. Um, and um, uh, I think, you know, the, the PD could correct me if I'm wrong. We've indicated that we, uh, I know that we have not towed anyone. I also don't believe that we have pursued any um, judge's orders for that. Um, and um, I believe that's the case. Yep, I'm, I'm seeing at least one uh, affirmative yes there. And that's at least uh, the understanding from myself and, and some others. So um, thank you for that. My, my follow-up question there is um, related to the intention of the city to seek uh, judge's orders for, for such toes because it seems to me that the purpose of this is largely to get RVs off the street. <laughs> um, at least that's what I've heard my my colleagues say they want to do. And um, so if vehicles can't be towed and we're just amassing, they're just amassing tickets, it just, it, again, it's one more um, bucket for tickets for unhoused people or vehicularly housed people to contend with um, or not contend with as the case may be. And so that's sort of a, there's my side comment <laughs> with my question, will the city pursue uh, judge's orders for, to tow, and at, at what point would that decision be made? I think that's best. Uh, there's our police chief that <laughs> I was looking for. Chief Escalante is recognized. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, we are currently working on, uh, we have to write a search warrant. To, to seize any vehicle, whether it's related to the oversized vehicle ordinance or a collection of five unpaid tickets or more for any violation. Um, new law requires us to write a search warrant. Um, and we are working with our, our judges to figure out what that really looks like. Um, because we have an obligation outside of even the oversized vehicle ordinance to address those that collect that bucket of, of citations that you talked about. So um, we are working on that to give us that option. Thank you. Um, uh, so I would just say, um, you, there's more, I'll stop. You want to hear them? More? No, no, I just meant, I was gonna say, make a comment. Now you're, thank you, uh, Chief Escalante. So, um, I think, I guess I would just say it's disingenuous to suggest, well, that's not happening, so let's not worry about it, given that it the intention is for that to occur. Um, I, I just have to point that out. Um, I'm not sure there's much to be done about it. It'll be, um, we'll see how it goes. But I, I would argue all the more reason for uh, continued community oversight, a stakeholder group that that is it really actually involved in um, these kinds of steps as the decision gets made to, to take those steps, there should be oversight of that. I think we should hold ourselves to the same standards that we expect of other, our contractors and our 
um, human service providers that they provide some analysis and evaluation and metrics. Um, and I think that's the case for kind of all, I have a lot of questions related to, you know, how many toes, how many tickets, um, and, and I'm not asking that you answer those questions now, but that is information that sh I believe should be um, publicly available. Can you tell us about how it is that that information will be made publicly available? Um, just as an aside, you said yes. we're going to give qualitative and quantitative information, but the, do the paper, the documents we have, quantitative information where feasible. So that, that could mean a lot or it could mean almost nothing. Sure. What are we going to get? Yeah, so the, uh, the number of tickets is definitely a quantitative um, uh, set of information. Um, and that is, um, as you can see, oops, oops. It just moved. Um, as you can see on the slide here, you know, this is how many we've had since the December 4th implementation um, with most of those happening in, in the first week. We will continue to um, keep track of that. Um, the other uh, quantitative information that we have at this point is um, the number of trash bags collected. And um, we, um, we still do have issues there. Um, but I think it was a 46% reduction or 48% reduction um, in uh, the number of trash bags collected in the uh, 11 months prior to uh, the average of the 11 months prior and then the three months, uh, December, January, and February leading up to right. now. So another quantitative um, we'd also be looking at um, any other quantitative data that we, we can collect. Um, the quantitative is challenging, and that's why we put both of those in there, the, both the qualitative and quantitative. Um, but certainly those two are um, readily available and things that we're currently tracking. And we continue to look at uh, things. The, the stakeholder group, um, for example, uh, suggested when we, when we brought this question to them, that maybe we could also look at number of um, service calls unrelated to oversized vehicles, but service recalls related to um, you know, aggressive behavior or fights or things of that sort that they get called out to in these areas to to um, also um, have another quantitative metric. Um, that is something that we would continue to work with the stakeholder group on with those ideas. Um, and if I could, just one last thing, um, I just wanted to point out that, you know, the, the towing of vehicles is the last resort, right? It is, it's, it's not the step that anyone wants to take. Um, and so that's um, really, um, if, if we have to, um, uh, if we, if there's no other option, really. Last question, thank you. Um, uh, and I really wanna appreciate Council Member Bruner for um, raising the question around the conditions because I was gonna ask about some of those. That was much more efficient. Um, the last question, you are gonna make information available according to the, um, the agenda report to the Coastal Commission Executive Director upon request. Why, is there a reason we wouldn't be just submitting information to them? annually just because they have have a role to play in approval of this permit. They demonstrated that. I think the commissioners are going to be interested um, not to monitor on the ground realities day to day, but to at least have a sense of what's going on. The, uh, that's certainly something that um, could be conditioned and the um, Coastal Commission may actually request it on a more frequent basis as well. Um, and so certainly uh, as they requested. And um, one of the things that we've talked about as a team is just that we are going to need to stay on top of tracking um, this information um, so that um, we're, we're not at, at the end of the year and um, trying to recall something that happened 11 months earlier, right? And so. Um, that is something that we would be able to do should the executive director request it. And if uh, it pleases the council, and then you know, that, that condition could be updated so that it is an annual report, for example. Um, and uh, that gives an overview of um, how we've been implementing the program, the outreach that we've done, um, the feedback from the stakeholder group, as, as you all could see from 
the materials that were provided to you. You know, we take very detailed notes as part of those stakeholder group conversations, and um, that allows for um, both you all and other member and members of the public, and also um, other uh, bodies like the Coastal Commission, to really um, get the the flavor for uh, how those conversations have gone. Thank you. Let me uh, take a moment, Mr. Mr. Meisler. Mr. Meisler, I want to let me get your attention here. What we're going to do is uh, at 4:20, we've got a group of folks who are uh, going to be going to Japan on a sister city program, and they're going to come in here. We're going to do some nice things together. So, if what we can do is in a couple of minutes, we'll suspend this. We'll do that, then we'll come back to your item. All right. That's how we're going to handle this. So, uh, but before we get there, because we're not at 4:20, um, an hour that will live in infamy, um, we'll. Uh, I had a couple of questions or a couple of comments. One is, um, we have gotten, as a city, incredibly focused on this item, and not without reason. I understand that, and 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 I think we should. We're con incredibly, compa in my view, very compassionate community. Uh, you get to Santa Cruz, we want to make sure your life works out as best that it can. And we have, as the city, certain responsibilities. County has certain responsibilities. State and federal government has certain responsibilities. We do not have every responsibility for everybody who comes into the city of Santa Cruz. Um, People who come in in an oversized vehicle are not automatically wards of the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, there are certain things we should do that a compassionate community would do. Um, I don't know that it is our responsibility to provide gas or insurance or repairs or registration or whatever for a vehicle. I'm not sure, in, in my mind anyway, I think that's a vast expansion of the, of the responsibility of the city of Santa Cruz, and I don't believe it's ours. Um, I think that this uh, item, uh, with regard to the way that it has been uh, processed uh, with stakeholders, with numerous interactions with the Coastal Commission, uh, that uh, from my point of view, I think that what is coming forward to us uh, makes an awful lot of good sense. So what I will do at this point is we will uh, simply suspend this item for a few minutes while we hear another item, and then we will come back to this. So let's take a couple of minute break, and we're going to let folks come in. Santa Cruz City Council is back in session. The hour of uh, 4.23 having arrived. We are very happy to see a bunch of uh, smiley faces over here and uh, in our chambers, and we welcome you here this afternoon. Glad to see you. Ms. Snook, we understand that uh, you are going to be making a presentation, and we welcome you here to the City Council, and so happy to have you. Thank you very much, um, Mayor. Vice Mayor, City Council. I am Linda Snook. I'm the current chair of the Santa Cruz Sister Cities Committee and also of the Shingu Subcommittee. And I'm here with my fellow subcommittee member and chaperone, Adrian Harrell. Chandra Donahue couldn't be here today, but she's also a chaperone. I always like to quote our mission, which is to promote peace through mutual respect, understanding, and cooperation, one individual and one community at a time. And we work with our members to play an essential part in creating a more peaceful world through people-to-people -people exchanges and initiatives. And I can't think of a better way to do that than through a homestay-based youth delegation. So I'm really happy and proud that we are resuming this youth delegation. I'm delighted to present to you the 14 youth delegates and two interns who have been selected from a large group of wonderful applicants this year to represent the city of Santa Cruz in our sister city of Shingu, Japan. 
After getting to know them a bit better during the language and culture classes we've been holding for them, I'm quite sure they will all do a fine job of representing our city and of hosting the incoming high school del delegation, which will be visiting from Shingu this summer. And a shout out and thank you to the Parks and Rec Department for all their help with the logistics for all the activities that we do with the children and adults. Following the incoming high school delegation, this fall begins the 50th anniversary of our friendship with Shingu. And in honor of that, that we have invited the mayor of Shingu, their city council, and some honored business people to come visit Santa Cruz. And I'm very happy to say that they have accepted. And Mayor Tauka Sensei and others will be here October 2nd through 9th, 2024, this fall. And I know you will all want to help welcome them. <laughs> and they, in turn, invite all of you to visit Shingu as a mayoral delegation for the 50th anniversary in fall of 2025. And I hope many of you will take advantage of that opportunity. As these young folks are about to find out, Shingu is a remarkable place for its natural beauty and mostly for its very kind citizens who have many times in the last 50 years gone way above and beyond to welcome Santa Cruz citizens and show them an amazing experience of a lifetime. And I thank you all for promoting, for supporting our mission to promote peace and by cultivating individual friendships across all kinds of borders, um, not only across country borders, but within our community. We have five different schools represented here in this group of young people. And I'd like to present now our youth delegates, uh, intern Aidan Bingham uh, and Naomi Gerhardt, who's not here today. And the youth delegation, Amara Anderson, uh -huh. Avery Schramm, Daisy Harlan, Daphne Bingham, Eliza McGinnis, Gillian Hall, Ginger Maxfield, Judy McKee, Joaquin Cervantes Brewer, Logan Franks, Marina Tucker, Naomi Duria, and Matthew Salas, Salas could not be here today. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, before we invite the students up to stand here, and we'll take a picture and so on, uh, I know that we want to make a couple of remarks and, and thank you for everything. My, my colleague, uh, Ms. Brown, I see, I'm going to see if I can bring her to tears here because as we were getting ready for this, she said to me that this is going to change your life, that she has been to Japan and this is going to change your life. But, but Ms. Brown, see if I can make you cry. <laughs> I, I've never been able to cry on cue, but <laughs> I do feel it. I really feel the emotion. Um, we, it's an incredible place. The, the people that you will meet and engage with will, they really will um, open up n new ways of thinking about the world. Uh, um, I'm just, I'm so incredibly stoked for you all <laughs> that you're going to do this. Yeah. There we go. Close. <laughs> Ms. Watkins is recognized. I just want to congratulate every one of you. As my colleagues shared, this is going to be an incredible experience for you. I had the opportunity of going in 2019, and the level of care and welcoming that the people of Shingu provide us when we visit is overwhelming and truly to the mission of promoting peace and interconnected worlds and people. It, it feels like that, and 50 years is something to be so proud of. I want to thank you both for all of the things that you do in terms of volunteering to make this happen for our city and our community, and along with our uh, city parks and rec department. Um, it's, a, it's a really, it's an outstanding relationship that we have, and I think you're all going to have an incredible experience, and I can't wait to hear about it after. So have fun and enjoy. <laughs> Now let me, uh, for a couple of minutes here, we're going to recess the council meeting so that you can have an opportunity to come up here, get behind us, we'll take a couple of pictures.
Council's back in session. We are now resuming uh, our work on item number 20. And uh, council members, I want to make sure, uh, have you had an opportunity to ask your initial set of questions? All right, good. Um, this is the opportunity for the public to comment on this appeal. So if it, provided you're not an appellant, we're gonna hear from them one more time. But if you are here to speak on this item, uh, this is the opportunity to do so. Let me ask if you would like, uh, sir, just come on up, come on up. Good afternoon, welcome to the council. Good afternoon, good afternoon and thank you city council and all of you. My name is Margaret Gannon, and I live at 2395 Delaware Avenue, De Anza Mobile Home Park, uh, a senior mobile home park. We have about 200 mobile home spaces and around 300 plus residents. The majority of them are seniors. The park and all of its residents want to thank you, the city council, Bernie Escalani, and the Santa Cruz City De Police Department, Evan Morrison, the director of the Safe Parking Program, mm -hmm. for enforcing the oversized vehicle ordinance and giving back seniors and all others their peace of mind regarding their health and safety on the city streets of Santa Cruz. It's working. Let's keep it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Welcome. Mayor, Welcome, City sir. Council members, City staff, City Attorney. My name is Carl James Fox. Lived in Santa Cruz 55 years. I'm disabled. My mother's disabled. She's 90 in a wheelchair. She lives at 1010 Pacific Avenue. The last two years I've been parking the handicapped vehicle that I have outside her apartment. It's a school bus. It's exactly 20 feet long. It has decals of wheelchairs on it. It has a wheelchair on the license plate. And it has a placard that I put in the window. I received the first ticket on December 4th. It's parked in the handicapped spot in front of uh, five guys across the street from 1010 Pacific. I sent the ticket for review. I didn't want it dismissed. I requested an official measurement. Uh, within a week, I had two more tickets. I took those for review. The tickets were sent for review back to the officer who wrote them. He's not a parking control officer, so maybe it's the first tickets he ever wrote. I don't know. He sent back saying, your vehicle is 20 feet 6 inches. Your review's denied. It came back from San Jose. It was already past due by the time I received it. So I said, can I send it for further review? They said, no, that you've missed that window now. I said, well, where is the official measurement station? That's the question I have for the city attorney, for the chief of police, for anyone else that's responsible for writing these tickets. If you have an ordinance based on measurement, doesn't there need to be a mechanism for the people that have vehicles to be measured? What if my vehicle's proven to me to be 20 feet one inch? Well, then I know I can modify it one inch because I know the official measurement. So these tickets, can, I'm being told, cannot be reviewed. I was told by the manager over there at the parking control office, ADA law does not supersede the city ordinance. Now, this is having an effect on my life and my mother's life. We're both disabled. We've been in Santa Cruz 65 years. I'm her sole caregiver. I parked that van there to give us a sense of relief, knowing in case of emergency, we could transport those are my questions. I need relief from this issue right now. Thank well, you. I just bought a new tape measure. My vehicle's parked right outside, Mayor. 
I want an official measurement. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take uh, just a minute. Uh, what we're going to do is there's a person online. We'll take them, and then we'll take you. Uh, person online, good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Person online, good afternoon. Three, two, one. Amy Chen Mills, welcome to the council meeting. Uh, here. No, we'll hear we'll hear you after Ms. Mills. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you so much uh, for being here, for being our council members. Um, I didn't think I was going to say anything. I was really interested to hear how this issue has developed um, from all sides, and it sounds like there's been a lot of really good communication. Um, and working together on some of these issues, thanks to everyone and the stakeholders. I think that's great, and I, I'm glad for that, given that I was on the um, Committee on Homelessness. Um, I just want to speak a little bit to my own personal experience. I had a friend who was working for me from time to time at my house who became unhoused. Uh, she had nowhere to go. The first thing she did was take all of her savings and buy the most... Um, rundown, <laughs> ridiculous RV that she could find and ended up down on Delaware. At that time, I was trying to help her, talk to her on the phone. Her hair was falling out. She was losing weight by the day, losing pounds daily. She was so stressed out. She could barely operate the vehicle. It was a huge vehicle for her to try to operate on her own. Um, and at one point I said, why don't you come? We're going to go out of town and you can house sit, park the RV in front of our house. Within probably 10 minutes of her getting in front of our house, this was before the OVO, we had two neighbors come to our house and start calling the police about her vehicle. And I know that people get alarmed and concerned. I told them that she's house sitting for us, but it's a sort of a tale, I think, of two different realities, those who are housed and how fearful they become, and those who are actually living like in fear for their lives, which she was. Um, finally, I was able to get her to um, a church that I'm a part of and to actually park her RV there. My husband had to drive it for her because <laughs> she could not drive it. Um, and it's taken probably nine months for her to start to regain her mental health. So the fact that we can provide people with stability, which I don't know that Tier 2 really does, but I know that the, um, the Armory does. Um, and I, so I sort of recommend that the comments that the appellants have made be incorporated as much as possible. I, I really like what Sandy said about codifying things, because otherwise, what are the rules? You know, it's just up to individual officers. Is it up to individual staff members? The person who's answering phones on the weekends, is that a rule that we have that they have to do that? Or they're just willing to do that? Or what is that? So I think that codification is important. And um, I'm glad I was here. And thank you so much. Thank you. We're going to go back to the person online. Good afternoon. Welcome to the city council meeting. <clears throat> Hi, good afternoon. This is Serge Cagno, Recovery Cafe, Stepping Up Santa Cruz. Um, I really want to um, state my appreciation for all of the time uh, staff have put into this. Um, I, I appreciate services and I appreciate um, uh, compassionate, uh, structured services. Um, I'd like to say that there should be some data uh, as we uh, look at the permit. Um, data that should be accepted should be quantified effects. Um, and one of the specific bits within the, the permit was the lack of quantified effects on the home, on the unhoused. Um, data that should not be accepted should be qualitative or anecdotal evidence. Uh, data that should not be accepted should be calls for service, which we know can be high percentage of frivolous and non-law breaking calls for service. Um, I'd also like to um, appreciate that staff are working on having a dumping site. I think that would make a huge difference in this entire conversation for the community. But within the discussion that we had, uh, maybe I missed it, but I didn't mention, I didn't hear Lee talk about uh, the length of time to uh, 
find such a site or the fact that that actually got started back in 2018 during the catch when I first asked about that. Um, so to in every one of these kind of meetings and appeals and all that stuff, there's always the city is working on it and it never seems to be happening. So an actual timeline would be great. Uh, in the permit documents that went to the planning committee um, for them to vote on, one of the comments was the county of Santa Cruz has an ordinance like this. Uh, there was no comment that the Coastal Commission actually told them that they never actually applied for um, to actually like to the Coastal Commission and the Coastal Commission staff actually told them that they were breaking the Coastal Act and they've still gone on with it. I think that's a valid piece of information as you make your decisions. But I do want to say I, I appreciate the compassionate services where they fit into this process. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? We'll take the next person online. Good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, this is Robert Norris of Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom. The OVO is itself a law, like the camping ban, which does not fairly serve the majority of homeless folks in their vehicles as the camping ban. Uh, really uh, appears to, but does not make, actually makes no attempt to serve the majority of people who are outside. Is it simply plays whack-a-mole, and in this case with the OVO, it is serving the city staff's purpose, which is to essentially, as Police Chief Escalante has reportedly said, make the city as uncomfortable as possible for those who are outside without appearing to do so. This happens when you run folks out of town and out of sight. This has got to be shoehorned into a liberal fantasy that meets the Coastal Commission's guidelines, and that's what this is all about. Uh, those are coastal access, justice requirements, adequate vehicular storage. I have some familiarity with this because I appealed it way back in 2015. The issue is not to be compassionate, as Fred so piously intoned, or even reasonable. Otherwise, the city will have in, in this last year with its uh, many grants, already established waste disposal stations, which would meet neighborhoods' concerns as well as those folks in their vehicles, and set up truly workable Tier 3 programs. They have not done this. You have a, an overloaded program which doesn't serve. It serves some people well, but a very small number, just as the shelter program serves some people but has nothing to do, simply dismisses the majority of homeless folks who are outside uh, with not even sanitary stations and toilets and uh, being provided for them. Forcing those whose only home is their vehicle here is for, and forcing them to move twice a day here is cruel and unusual punishment and should not be done. Let's do something about it. Thank you. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? Uh, one more hand. Right? One more hand. Person online, good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, I live on the Lower West Side, and I want to thank the council and city staff for having worked on the over, oversized vehicle ordinance. Uh, it's been many, many years, and we can see the results uh, in our in our neighborhoods, uh, where our homes are. I, I want to thank you very much. I particularly want to point out uh, Mr. Keeley's comments, Mayor Keeley's comments uh, a few minutes ago, I wholeheartedly um, agree with that. Um, also, I want to say that those of us who I believe the city is really bending over backwards to accommodate these folks, those of us who pay property tax, some of us a lot of property tax, uh, are, are, are funding this operation, and I think it's a good thing to do. But I find item number 11 on the proposed changes for the $200 gas to be an absolute insult to those of us who are working hard to pay our mortgages, to pay our property tax, and to pay our bills. Uh, so, again, thank you. Please deny this appeal. Thank you. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? Anyone else wish to make comment on this last opportunity? Thank you. Mr. Meisler, it is now your opportunity to uh, take up to five minutes, or the appellant, take up to five minutes to provide any additional rebuttal or response that you wish to provide. 
Thank you. Um, first, I want to respond, before I respond to the sort of point by point things, I just want to say something, a, no, a personal note about my own participation in the stakeholder group. Um, Reggie and I shared uh, attendance because sometimes we just couldn't make it. The first stakeholder meeting that I went to, I was truly shocked at the palpable hostility in the room that I felt as a housed community member. There was one other um, uh, stakeholder who was critical of OVO, and they were on Zoom, and every other stakeholder in the room was, was a supporter of OVO. Neither one of the unhoused or uh, vehicular dwelling stakeholders were there. Um, and it was, it was shocking. And it took me a couple of days to get over it. And for all the wonderful effort that staff has put into it, this was not a trauma-informed process. And people who have lived experience of houselessness, along with so many of the rest of us in our society, in our communities, need trauma-informed processes. I am not surprised that Jamie didn't come back. I was very happily surprised that the Tier 3, the 24-7 stakeholder was there. The next time I attended, I was very glad to to hear his thoughts. Um, I think that he was incredibly important to the process. I also want to say that my perception is that we spoke about most of these things in the meetings. The, and and I'm, I'm not trying to throw shade on anybody, but my perception was that the, the suggestions of people who were uh, in favor of OVO were taken percentage-wise more than our suggestions. Um, and that may be because our suggestions aren't seen as viable or not supported by as many of the letters that you're getting, but these are justice-based. They're based on what we hear from people with lived experience, and they're based on the participation of ACLU and disability rights advocates. And these are experts. These are legal experts. They, they spend their professional lives and much of their free time working on these issues. Um, so I think it's unfortunate that some of what, what we suggested, that, that's one reason why we're bringing it to you here. Because we, we need to be heard. We have a duty to be heard. OK? So I, I just want to do a couple of quick points. Um, thank you, S C Council Member Sandy, for bringing up the inconsistency of the application of the law. Flexibility is great. It can also be harmful, incredibly harmful to people. Many, many people, when you get the data, we can even send it to you um, because we filed FOIAs to get it. Many people have multiple tickets. And you've heard a little bit about the stress that this can cause people. Some people get left alone. Some people get multiple tickets. Some people get harassed. Some people don't. This is, this is uneven and, and fundamentally unfair. And yes, one of the reasons why we're pursuing this is because it's not codified. And we don't know what could happen in one year, three years, five years. So again, we feel that this is our responsibility. Um, we also see with the, you know, there's no honeypot truck. There's an enforcement before services. So I know that this is very challenging and the city is working on it. But there are sort of like, up at the UCSC trailer parks, they have external tanks. There are things that are less expensive and less infrastructure. Uh, we have documented two vehicles with the ADH tags that have gotten multiple tickets. You heard from one person. Again, inconsistency. Um, and in terms of gas offsets, community charity is not an adequate substitute for systemic solutions to what is a systemic problem of houselessness and a cost of living crisis. Um, so I think that covered everything for me. Sorry to like rush, rush, rush. Um, we are disappointed that we're not hearing as much positive indication about our list as, as we would like. And I would really urge you all to really go for it. 
listen to us, listen to our stakeholders, we're the people affected. Thank you. Matters back before the council. Councilmember Kalantar Johnson is recognized. Thank you. I'd like to move to deny the appeal and uphold the Planning Commission's acknowledgement of environmental determination and approval of the coastal permit based on the findings listed in the draft resolution and the conditions of approval attached as Exhibit A. Um, I have a second portion to my motion. I emailed it to you, Bonnie, um, is to direct staff to report back to the OVO subcommittee and the stakeholder group regarding the actions that are in process, such as a detailed outgoing message for overnight parking program regarding where individuals can park on an emergency basis, um, calling during non-business hours, such as progress on mobile dumping station. There's a motion. Is there a second? There's a second by the Vice Mayor. Madam, excuse me, uh, Ms. Kalantari Johnson, you may open on your motion. Did you get that? Do you want me to show it? I'm... Unless others need to see I'm it. Okay. Sorry, excuse me. Well, she was asking if she wanted to, if we needed to see the motion. Okay. If you um, could, that'd be just better? fine. Put okay. that up there. Sure. Um, yeah, I just, um, you know, this has been an issue in our community for over a decade. I know um, Vice Mayor Golder has worked on it. Um, I think that's what, I don't want to speak for you, but maybe inspired you to um, seek elected office. I know a lot of community members have worked for it, worked on this, and it's been a long road. It's been a contentious road. Um, it's it's um, both brought our community together and pulled us apart at some times, and I think that we've landed in a really exceptional place. Um, I don't think, I'm hearing and seeing from others in the community that we've landed in an exceptional place. We as a city have gone above and beyond um, in addressing this public health, public safety issue. And let me just say, it's a public health and public safety issue for those who are housed and those who are unhoused. We're connecting people to services, we're connecting people to long-term housing, um, and the numbers are there. In a short amount of time, we've connected I know the whole, the whole Homeless Action Response Plan, we've connected um, around 200 people to permanent housing. Um, this, is, this is being noticed by our community members. It's being noticed by other communities around the nation. Um, and I think that, sure, there are things that we can do to improve. There are always things that we can do to improve. So let's continue on this path. Let's continue to work together. And let's continue to learn from each other. Um, there is always more need. There will always be more need. And as the Mayor Keeley mentioned, you know, this is outside of our scope, what we're doing. Health and Human Services is really belongs in the county. We are working closely with the county. We have commitment from our county supervisors, including Supervisor Cummings, to work on this issue with us. Um, we've been in touch with him. We've been in touch with his office. So there's lots happening um, at the county level. Mayor Keeley and I now serve on the Housing for Health Policy Board. Um, this came up as a, as a discussion point in the last policy board that providing more safe parking for oversized vehicles and vehicles should be a priority that all jurisdictions take up um, so that the burden isn't just on the city of Santa Cruz to address the needs that we have um, in our city and countywide. So I'm really um, grateful for the work that staff has done. I'm grateful for the work of the stakeholder group, um, every single person that served on the stakeholder group, and the community at large that, you know, again, has worked on this for over a decade now. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. For the debate or discussion. Ms. Brown is recognized. Oh, I'll, I'll just make a couple of brief comments. Um, I am not going to, this is mostly for the appellants, um, I, I'm not going to try to uh, include your condi these conditions here. I um, absolutely understand why you presented them. I appreciate the work you've done, the thoughtful Ness of, of your participation and your recommendations, um, but like you, I'm um, concerned about the hostility that I may encounter in in trying to move this forward, and it, it really seems futile. So um, I would just say that I support. <laughs> um, you know, I think your points are really well taken, and I support you. I'm not going to try to wordsmith conditions here because I just don't see any percentage in it. Um, but I do think that, um, and I will speak. Uh, to my colleagues on the council um, that 
uh, it would behoove you and, and city leadership to think about um, the concerns that were expressed by the Coastal Commission, commissioners, um, in particular Commissioner Nothoff, um, and that uh, some these are potentially gonna be looked at by another body that has to approve this. So I'm just gonna encourage you to think seriously about that um, as things proceed. I think it's really critical that uh, community engagement continue and um, kind of disappointed to see the limited role or the, kind of the limited um, time that, that may be spent engaging with the stakeholder group moving forward. Um, I, I think that it would behoove us as a city to, to really um, reconsider that and, and work more closely um, so that we don't have situations, we don't need to have situations uh, like what um, Mr. Fox, did I get that right, um, uh, explained where we, ha we clearly have uh, some misinformation and we have people who are um, now in, in struggling with that. Um, so and as an aside, please, can, we, can somebody follow up with this gentleman to, to try to work out what is happening? Because if our parking enforcement is saying that the OVO supersedes disability um, <laughs> placards, that is just not the case. And so that's just a plea. Um, I, I think I'll leave it there um, because I, I don't want to just keep you know, <laughs> carrying on with my, my concerns. <laughs> City manager is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I wanted to provide an opportunity for Mr. Butler to respond with a proposed condition regarding one of the concerns that Councilmember Brown raised earlier. Mr. Butler. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this is actually on the wrong condition. Let me. Um, so. Um, in response to some of the concerns that we heard from the community members um, during uh, the uh, deliberation here, we were coordinating with both the police chief and our parking programs manager to understand how from a um, perspective of um, implementation, we might be able to address uh, one of those concerns. And um, so I'll read this condition and then, um, and would welcome any questions. So it says, the city shall recommend that any hearing officer overseeing parking ticket appeals should waive any OVO parking tickets received within a 72 hour period, during which time the appellant provides evidence that their vehicle was disabled and unable to relocate. What this would mean is if they have, so we have the 24 hour provision right now, and if we had something um, where they provided a receipt to the hearing officer saying, here's where uh, I had my vehicle fixed. It was inoperable at the time. Here's where um, I purchased uh, a new alternator or whatever part it may be. Um, and it was inoperable at the time. Um, this would be one way. It's, it, and the reason why we've worded it this way is because it would be challenge for, challenging for our police officers who are providing tickets to know, for example, if no one was at the vehicle that it is disabled, um, or if there's a different officer that's coming out, they may not recognize that. So if it's the will of the council, this is a, a way that that could be addressed um, while um, also not um, adversely affecting how we would implement the, uh, the program. Thank you. Thank you for offering that. Yes, I, I include that in the motion. If it's okay by the secretary. I want to make sure you know what's now going to be included in the motion. What is it we're putting in the motion? What is it you want in the motion? To add, to, to add this additional condition of approval. It's on the screen. So it would be. Are you good with that? I have a okay. Question, the vice mayor is recognized. I have a question specifically about this. My understanding is you're not allowed to work on vehicles on our streets already under existing codes. No matter, you know, it's wouldn't you have to have it towed to a garage to work? I mean, am I, am I wrong? I don't think you want to go there. <laughs> 
So then I, then I would say someone's, then I would say the opposite is true. Someone, if it is, some people are getting special treatment being allowed to work on their vehicles, you know. Uh, good afternoon. Sure. Go ahead. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, so the California, uh, Gavin Hussey, parking program manager for the city. Uh, the California Vehicle Code does specify that a disabled vehicle should be parked off street um, and either in a driveway or parking garage. So there is language in there about working on disabled vehicles in the right of way. Inoperable vehicles are supposed to be removed to subside streets or off street locations. But I think what we're trying to do here is make sure there's an accommodation. We're not sure if the vehicle is disabled. We would be willing to work with the individual to allow them to try to, um, to, try to make accommodations for their parking on the street. If I might uh, ask, uh, thank you, um, ask you some questions, Mr. I understand. So Coastal Commission approves our ordinance at some point, and now we're in this one-year review period, and we're, we're moving along. As I understand it, stakeholder group meets, public outreach took place, Planning Commission has a hearing. So from when the Coastal Commission approved the contents of our measure, as we are in the review period to go back to them, at the stakeholder level, were there changes recommended that are reflected in what you are now proposing? In other words, were any of the stakeholder recommendations included in what you now want to bring forward to the Coastal Commission? In this, uh, what you got on the screen right now? I don't know about what's on the screen right now, but oh, in, in general. Yes, um, yes. In fact, uh, lots there, from the, the appellants. Uh, in addition to the stakeholder meetings, there were other public outreach efforts, is that correct? Above and beyond the stakeholder meeting? We have heard from many members of the public surrounding this, um, both through the public hearing process and separate. And in the public hearing process and outside of it, any of the recommendations that people have made are they include? Are any of those recommendations included in what you brought forward? Yes. Okay. The planning commission held a hearing on this matter, and did they make any changes? They accepted recommended changes that staff made at the at, at the time of the hearing in response to the feedback that we received. Okay. Now the reason I do that is because what I want to be certain of is that. As we've gotten closer and closer and closer to this meeting, outreach has resulted in changes, changes, and changes. And in fact, one more is being recommended right here, right now, as part of this motion, if I understand it. Uh, the reason I do that is that I understand the appellant's arguments. What I, what I don't accept is that somehow from when the Coastal Commission approved this to now going back to the Coastal Commission, nobody got heard, no changes were made, et cetera. Because it seems to me that lots of people were heard, lots of changes have been made. They aren't every change that everybody wanted, but there are quite a number of changes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, that, that helps me understand what I thought was in front of us. I'm going to take just a moment with my colleague, Ms. Brown, who, who knows, because we've had a very, very long-standing relationship that preceded this, our, our appearance together, our joint service on the city council. I hope that at least insofar as the time that I've been mayor, I hope that you have never felt that either my comportment of these meetings or that these meetings are hostile to you. Because if you feel that, I extend my apology to you and I will do my best going forward to not make you feel that way. Because you made a reference to hostility here and I, I uh, again, I extend my apology if you feel that way as a result of anything I've done. It is, uh, I think, uh, a testimony to this group of people who are on here right now that we can disagree without being disagreeable and it's one of the things I've really enjoyed about being mayor but if our feelings are our feelings we can't debate them so if, if that feeling occurred to you I apologize 
further debate or discussion, Ms. Bruner is recognized. Thank you. Um, good discussion. Thank you for all the follow-up information. Um, I think what, I, what I'd like to just make sure is call out a point to be discussed at future stakeholder meetings um, so that we can get clearer on um, the uh, California Vehicle Code has a provision of a 24-hour period for breakdown of vehicles. And uh, Director Butler cited an instance of where one vehicle was given a week um, so that, you know, to, to we approach it with flexibility, which I think is great. But I think we need to know um, for certain, like, a range. Like, you have a minimum of 24 hours up to one week um, for those types of instances. I think that stability of knowing is huge. And I don't know what that time is. We aren't here to make that decision now, but I would really like to see that um, solidified a little more. So coming back to us. Happy, happy to have that continued discussion. You. Further debate or discussion? No, no debate or discussion, but clarification. Yes. Um, who, was the, who was the second? OK. Um, and then, sorry, I asked you, but I didn't hear what your answer was. Um, your your um, motion said uh, resolution as presented. Uh, it the said. The point had edits to the conditions of approval, aside from this one. Mm. Yeah. What is the recommended? The, the conditions that we read through, that Tim read through. Um, so I can include, I can give you a moment on each of these slides if you'd like to read them. Well, so, so what I refer to in my motion is as it's written on the agenda, uh, and it refers to the conditions of approval attached as Exhibit A. So there were additions in, to that Exhibit A. That's correct. So um, we just need to change that language, I think. To also include the recommendations You're from okay staff. You're okay with the um, recommended addition? Yes. Okay, that's yes. all I wanted to clarify. Correct. So however we capture that. Is that sufficient? Bonnie, as, to just as say. presented. As presented, yeah. there you go. Thank you. So attached as Exhibit A, just a, um, conditions of approval as presented instead of attached at Exhibit A. Thank you. Okay. Thank, <laughs> thank you for that, Ms. Bush. No further debate or discussion. The clerk will call the roll. Council Member is Newsom. Aye. Brown. No. Watson. Aye. Bruner. Aye. Ellen Tari Johnson. Aye. Vice Mayor Gold. Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. We are on item 21. Item 21 is an ordinance amending Santa Cruz Municipal Code Chapter 13.12, use of skateboards and bicycles at city-owned parks and recreational facilities. We will give an opportunity here for a changing of the guard for a moment. The changing of the guard has occurred. I'll recognize Ms. Duck. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. Stephanie Duck with the City Attorney's Office. I'm here to present to you today with uh, Director of Parks and Recreation, Tony Elliott, on proposed amendments to Santa Cruz Municipal Code Chapter 1312. Um, I prepared a very, very brief slideshow for everyone just so they had everything up in front of them. 
and Bonnie has graciously agreed to help me move through the slides, so thank you. Um, so the city adopted Santa Cruz Municipal Code Chapter 13.12 to comply with requirements in the Health and Safety Code. Uh, the Health and Safety Code previously prohibited an operator of a skate park from allowing a person to ride a skateboard in that facility unless that person was wearing a helmet, elbow pads, and knee pads. Um, a local public agency that owned or operated a skateboard park could, um, that was not supervised on a regular basis satisfy those requirements by adopting an ordinance requiring that a person riding a skateboard in that skate park um, wear a helmet, elbow pads, and knee pads, and by posting signage affording notice that the person was required to wear that safety gear and could be subject to citation for failing to do so. Next slide, please. Uh, so these proposed amendments, um, Health and Safety Code Section 115-800 was amended in 2020 to incorporate reference to uh, skateboards and other wheeled recreational devices. So those are defined as non-motorized bicycles, scooters, inline skates, roller skates, or wheelchairs being used for recreational purposes. These pro proposed amendments before the, before the council today update uh, Chapter 13.12 to incorporate reference to wheeled recreational devices. And so as written now, Chapter 13.12 would prohibit a person from riding a skateboard or other wheeled recreational device in a city park or recreational facility that is designed for such use of those devices, um, unless that person is wearing a helmet, elbow pad, and knee pads. Next slide, please. Um, and finally, and just very quickly, I think it's worth noting that the Health and Safety Code um, explicitly deems the riding of a skateboard or other wheeled recreational device at a city-owned um, or operated facility a hazardous recreational activity um, in certain circumstances. And so that would be when the person is riding uh, the device is 12 years of age or older. Uh, the type of riding was a stunt trick, uh, lunge or stunt trick or luge riding that caused the injury. And the city had adopted an ordinance and posted signage in compliance with Health and Safety Code Section uh, 115-800. Um, so as the council is aware, um, under the government code, a public entity is not liable to a person who participates in a hazardous recreational activity. And so by adopting these amendments, the city will not only be ensuring compliance with the health and safety code, um, but will also afford the city immunity in some, some circumstances. That is all. Very straightforward and quick, but we are here for questions if you have any. Council members, questions? 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 I, it just sounds like a, a, an update, a state-required update, helmets, knee pads, safety at skate parks oh, and wheeled recreational devices okay fairly straightforward thank you <laughs> for the questions or comments be glad to entertain a motion i'm sorry excuse me public anyone with us wish to comment on this item anybody online want to comment on this item seeing and hearing none the matter is back before the council there's a motion by ms contar johnson second by ms brown <laughs> and uh under debate and discussion, seeing near none, clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watson? Aye. Brunner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golden? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion carries in so ordered. Thank you for your good work. We are on item 22, Parks and Recreation Fiscal Year 2023 Annual Update and 2024 Progress Update. Mr. Elliott, thank you for all of your good work on so many fronts and uh, for a wonderful Saturday morning out at Harvey West Park for the first pitch of Little League season. Aww. If you have not seen what uh, the photos from <laughs> Mr. Elliott and the Parks Department, it is uh, the cutest thing in the history of cute things. So <laughs> you should avail yourself of that. Mr. Director, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor. Thank you very much for that. That was an excellent summary of opening day on Saturday. I appreciate that. It got cuter as it went along, too, because it was majors and then t-ball by the end. So it got a little less organized as things went along. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity uh, today to present our 2023, this is fiscal year 2023 annual report and a brief progress update on fiscal year 2024. I'm joined with our principal management analyst, Lindsay Bass. Um, I will do a lot of talking, so bear with me, and I'll try to be uh, efficient uh, as we go through this, but appreciate the opportunity to provide updates. Um, 
and we will jump into it here. So as far as context um, on our annual Sorry. report. Sorry to interrupt. Please You're not screen sharing yet. Oh, is it not up there? Thank you for that. Thank you. I'm assuming that the audience is all online for this, so I mean, not not too many folks here, but. Why did nobody say? But the best is for the best. I know. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. All right. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, Lindsay. All right, so I wanted to give our annual report a little bit of context. This is actually our fourth year as a department uh, doing an annual report, and this is really about performance measurement, uh, telling the story of what we accomplished as a department uh, in service to the city of Santa Cruz uh, over the last year. So for some context, uh, Parks and Rec is guided by the city's general plan, uh, by our Parks Master Plan uh, for 2030, a whole range of property-specific plans like the Poganet Master Plan to different management plans, uh, that we have, um, and then down to a strategic plan, a departmental strategic plan that's really complementary of the city's st uh, strategic plan. And then each year, of course, through the budget, we submit our uh, goals uh, and achievements through the budget that are reflective of that strategic plan. So there's a whole series of plans, guiding documents uh, that really guide what we do and, and why we do it. And so uh, the annual report that we're presenting today is really a look back. It's a retrospective that in some ways will feel like a really long time ago, uh, fiscal year 2023, but um, a sort of a performance assessment and summary of the work done in fiscal year 23. So in many ways, Santa Cruz is parks and recreation. Um, I won't belabor these points, but I think a lot of, the, of what we really love, the quality of life aspects, the health and wellness, the conservation, climate resiliency, the economy, property values, visitor spending, really Parks and Rec is at the heart of so much uh, in our town. By the numbers, this is reflected in the annual report. So um, 2 million plus people visited the wharf uh, in 23, nearly 100,000 participants in our programs and classes, uh, over 120,000 rounds of golf and disc golf played up at De La Viega uh, in 2023, and then values of trees, values of the acreage that we maintain so a lot of data, a lot of these uh, points um, uh, throughout the annual report. In terms of economic impact, just a, a brief illustration here. So this is the uh, visitation at the wharf over uh, fiscal year 2023. And you see this spike uh, sometime in late June of 2023. And that really is reflective of one of our key events out at the wharf, Woody's on the Wharf, it really drives that tourism, drives that economic impact. So really right at the heart of, uh, of what we do in Parks and Rec. If you look at Visit Santa Cruz County's uh, annual reports as well, they reflect on what are the drivers of tourism, what are the drivers of our local economy. A lot of those are reflected through Parks and Rec. So our beaches, uh, our trails, surf spots, uh, cultural attractions as well, the Wharf Surf Museum, uh, not to mention our top 10 world ranked uh, disc golf course. So a lot of things drawing people here, as well as serving people who uh, live and work here as well. In terms of our mission delivery, wanted to reflect on, oh, uh, wanted to reflect on, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Oh yes, there, there's an image here uh, we'll, we'll talk about in a moment. So in our annual report, um, we reflect on the three themes of uh, our mission in parks and recreation. And so that mission is rooted in providing quality public spaces and experiences, fostering equity and bettering the environment. So just a couple of highlights I'll go over that again are reflected in the plan, uh, but just to call out. So in terms of uh, providing quality public spaces and experiences, uh, we completed the Garfield Park and Playground renovation, I believe Vice Mayor, uh, Golder helped us cut the ribbon uh, on that one in 23. We had, uh, in that year, a record clam chowder event. And for fiscal year 24, we'll have a new record that we'll report on about a year from now. Um, Civic Auditorium attracted some of its biggest shows and events in a long time, from Bob Dylan to Modest Mouse, Bonnie Raitt. Uh, Bonnie Raitt ran with no power uh, on backup generators during storms. Uh, so it was a, a tremendous year at the Civic Auditorium. In terms of fostering equity, a lot of things, but just a, a quick uh, highlight. Uh, we had some antiquated rules in our softball leagues about 
um, uh, related to gender that we've really updated and modernized and really broke down a lot of barriers as it relates to gender uh, in our different leagues. No. Partnered with the Juneteenth Committee on the Juneteenth celebration, uh, included a march and parade. We partnered with Shared Adventures and Day on the Beach. Uh, to expand access uh, to Cowell Beach and expand opportunities for people with disabilities to enjoy the ocean and the beach. In terms of bettering the environment, a lot there as well. We leveraged um, research with UCSC and grant funding uh, to see really um, a, a huge uh, sort of explosion of tar plant regrowth um, out at Arana Gulch. Uh, as successful as we've seen in, in many years. Um, a lot of invasive removal funded through another grant out in Moore Creek and Poganip, uh, a lot of water conservation measures out of the golf course and in our parks as well. So just a lot of tremendous work uh, in 2023. And then in the center photo, I'm pretty sure Council Member Bruner uh, came back and won that race. Uh, so we'll have to look back at the record on that one. So a few key lessons that we learned, just wanted to reflect on, and this is part of the reason we do these annual reports, is to reflect on wh where we've been, what we went through, what we learned, and so just wanted to call out a couple of these, and this is in the report as well, but uh, 2023, fiscal year 2023 was really the end of the Benchland encampment, and so that was a huge camp, 240 plus people who were living in that camp at the time. Um, really just grew out of control and was a, a really a dangerous place to be, bad for the, the uh, people living there, bad for the community members um, living in the area, the park users, et cetera. And so, but I think that uh, the bench lines and cabinet was also uh, a great example of the collaboration among different departments in the city. So this is really, uh, if I can recall, the city manager was down there uh, helping clean up uh, and take out trash uh, one day, but the, the collaboration among departments from police, fire, city manager's office, um, public works, parks and rec, it was really a great example of that cross-departmental collaboration coming together to address that uh, camp, uh, offer everybody shelter. Not everybody took shelter, but it was, it was offered and we were able to abate that camp, get the site cleaned up. And then a few months after that, we had Earth Day. Uh, Mayor Keeley joined us there on the Duck Island stage um, and it felt like there was never a camp there in the first place. So a huge transition from uh, early fiscal year 23 to Earth Day in April. Um, that should say Earth Day 2023. Um, and then the um, where we are now is the San Lorenzo Park redesign, where we've had more than 2,000 community members engaged in this process to think about the future of the park moving forward. So uh, kind of tough times. Uh, collaborating with city partners uh, and working toward a kind of a brighter uh, path ahead. So just an example that we called out in the report. And building on this too, I just wanted to reflect on our community partnerships as well. And so there's some amazing uh, human beings up on the screen. Uh, once again, Jane Mio and the best, the Benchlands Environmental Stewardship Team uh, really uh, made uh, sort of lemonade out of lemons uh, in, in many ways with the Benchlands and Cabinet, but really creating a stewardship team in that riparian corridor. So just brilliant work. Uh, Jane won a state award for her work um, uh, with this group while the camp was going on. River cleanup events as well. You see Save the Waves in the picture here, Save Our Shores, Coastal Watershed Council, incredible partnerships there. And then San Lorenzo Park Neighbors, um, and many amazing organizations that really just partnered together through, again, tough times while the encampment was in the park, uh, but really did some uh, great work and, in fact, award-winning work. So some good stuff. So that is a quick run-through of our fiscal year 23 annual report. This is the cover sheet uh, for the community or for the council. Uh, this report will be found on the city's website under santacruzparksandrec.com. Um, it's not up yet. Uh, pending council direction today, we'll make final edits to the report. And we'll get that posted in the next week uh, or, or two up uh, on the website. So that I'll transition over to uh, our 2024 progress update. And this was my view from opening day uh, this past Saturday um, with all the kids. And so just wanted to reflect on a few items here um, related to 20. Uh, 24. So we're, we're nearing the end of fiscal year 2024. Um, again, this is guided, our work in 2024 is guided by our strategic plan and the city's strategic plan just to sort of orient what are we doing and why are we doing it. 
Um, a lot of really positive things um, happening this year. The San Lorenzo Park redesign I mentioned is ongoing. Uh, the council has heard about the master plan on aging and age-friendly designation through AARP that's been uh, before the city council. A lot of open space invasive removal is ongoing, grant funding. Um, the council heard from Santa Cruz Mountain Trail Stewardship earlier about the great work that they're doing. So a lot of things ongoing. Uh, event grant program, it's collaboration with the city manager's office that we just announced uh, a week or so ago, getting grants out to uh, event organizers in the community. A lot of internal assessment as well. We're doing a facility condition assessment to look at the, the condition of all of our 70 uh, facilities that we oversee through Parks and Recreation. What is their condition? What investment uh, are we making and should we make into the future? Um, we are looking at a fee study uh, in partnership with the planning department to look at our Quimby and park tax, our, our impact fees, uh, looking to update those. Uh, so doing that work as well. And one that we're excited about and reference back to this image is a Harvey West Park redesign uh, and rethinking the Harvey West pool as well. So we'll launch that um, this year uh, and we'll look forward to going through a, a robust community process uh, thinking about the future of Harvey West Park. A few challenges I just wanted to highlight um, in the midst of fiscal year 24, um, and these are kind of ongoing and these could be uh, talking points probably for most departments within the city, but uh, we continue to be very challenged with just insufficient system investment. Uh, we have around $100 million in deferred maintenance across the system. Um, a lot of uh, just failures uh, of our facilities um, uh, some new ones in the past week, including the, the roof at London Nelson Community Center, the roof and the structure at the uh, grill, the golf lodge up at De La Viega Park. So continuing to kind of see and feel the lack of investment over years and trying to find ways to invest in that and make those improvements um, any way we can. Um, lean staff, again, a theme that, that uh, could be from any department in the city, but um, I had a chance anecdotally to work with our medians crew, which is a subset uh, of our neighborhood parks team. We have two guys, Manny and Joaquin are their names, that maintain 13 miles of our city's medians. So uh, we were out there on Friday as the metro buses are zipping by, and uh, it's a little bit of terrifying work, but... Um, uh, incredible work that these teams do. Our urban forestry division is a division of one, Leslie Keedy, uh, that the council knows well. So really trying to figure out how do, how do we do this? How do we sustain this? How do we make these investments into the future uh, with the, the lean teams that we have? And um, last thing I wanted to mention on this slide related to Harvey West, I think that when we think of our a progress update or the state of parks and recreation in some ways, it really varies a lot. Um, so if you are a baseball player on opening day and you go to Harvey West Park, you may say, hey, these are the best fields in Santa Cruz County. City Parks and Rec, are, they're doing great. The parks are looking good. My experience is wonderful. Uh, so that can be a, that unique experience. But 100 yards further into the park, we have an active encampment. Uh, we have a public health uh, crisis, a Shigella outbreak. Uh, we have a lot of people suffering in that space. The park is getting trashed. And so if you are venturing into the park back in Friendship Garden, your experience of the parks is they're failing. But we're doing a, a terrible job. This isn't a safe place to go. People are, people are struggling here. So um, the experience can be vastly different, even within a matter of 100 yards or so in a given park. And so in between both of those, I'll... I'll I'll build on this a little bit more. In between those, we have a pool. And that pool is our, our second most highly demanded asset according to the Parks Master Plan. But the pool is also failing. And we don't have the, the budget to, to keep the pool up and running. We don't have the staff or the uh, really operators to run the pool. So just in this small area, this is sort of a case in point of what the Parks and Rec staff are sort of grappling with is providing the experience on a ball field that could be great. Uh, challenged with the large encampment and the public health outbreak a few hundred yards away, and then trying to meet the demand of the community in the pool. How do we fund this? How do we uh, come up with creative partnerships or solutions? Um, but the staff just in this one park are pulled many different directions just with those three pieces. So that's kind of the state of Parks and Rec. Um, it, we can't really say what that is. It depends. 
It depends where you are. It depends what your experience is. So it's nuanced, and we just wanted to share that context and perspective from staff uh, with the city council and with the community. Um, again, big picture, what we are really grappling with, and again, this could apply to any department in the city, is this balance, these trade-offs uh, within our department. So on one hand, the uh, budget, the staffing, the resources that we have, um, balanced with our service offerings, so uh, the portfolio that we have, uh, which is almost 2,000 acres and 50 parks and all of these facilities that we talk about, um, and then the service levels. And so this next slide, so as our budgets across the city, um, and what we've seen recently with the status quo budgets, uh, but with inflation, the sort of power of the dollar is reduced. Um, and again, this is for all departments. Um, but in Parks and Recreation, what that means is the power of that dollar is less, and our service offerings are staying the same, if not increasing. So for example, the rail trail uh, is wonderful, uh, but it's new scope. Uh, it's new uh, portfolio for Parks and Rec to manage. So that's staying the same, if not growing. So the result of this is our service levels are, are diminishing. So the quality of that median, the quality of the park, the quality of the experience um, that folks may have is, is steadily sort of decreasing. And so what we're trying to do is really sort of evaluate these three different pieces um, and evaluate these trade-offs and over time really um, uh, be tough and, and uh, think about the priorities that we have to set to try to, to utilize the resources we have to do the best we can with the portfolio that we have. Mm -hmm. So on that, uh, almost done here, thanks for bearing with me, but um, what we're really uh, uh, asking of the city council uh, in many ways, and really departments across the city is managing these trade-offs. So we want to make sure in all cases that we remain mission focused, that we don't get uh, scope creep or off uh, mission in, in any areas. We want to really uh, take a hard look at needs versus wants. So what are the core things that, that our community needs and really focus on those. We want to maximize public good. As we talked about in the example of San Lorenzo Park, we want to leverage partners both externally and internally, meaning uh, partner with those nonprofit organizations in the community, for example, and then internally with the city manager's office, with public works, police, fire, et cetera. Uh, that's where the, the sort of magic happens is when we're able to collaborate and partner across departments. And then find creative ways, uh, of course, to grow uh, our resources. Oops. So the, here's the crew. So this group right here, I just wanted to reflect on quickly, this, this crew is not... Uh, satisfied with the status quo. This is a group of folks who live here, who work here, and are not content uh, with doing the best we can. They really want to make this a better place for the next generation. So just wanted to give a shout out to the crew um, uh, here. And uh, again, a passionate group, really want to do it for the right reasons and make sure that we're not just managing, that we're not just maintaining, but we're really investing for the future. Uh, so the recommendation for the council today is to accept the fiscal year 2023 uh, Parks and Rec annual report and direct the staff to continue evaluation of service levels, service offerings, and associated resources in the delivery of our fiscal year 2024 goals. And happy to answer any questions. Mr. Director, thank you very much. Let me, uh, I'm, actually, I'm going to start over here for once. There we go. Now, Ms. Brown. I don't have many questions, but it's uh, that time of year for me to, <laughs> first, I, 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 it really is that time of year for me to ask the question, but I, first I want to say, he, once again, incredible work. Uh, the report you put together is phenomenal in terms of really demonstrating the, the breadth and depth of what you all do. Um, always want to find ways to provide more resources to your department because um, we see the benefits in our community across generations, um, you know, all walks of life. It's just, it's really incredible. And your your ability to maintain the, um, the Cadillac, or I think you said it was a Porsche at one time when we were talking, a Ferrari, it was a Ferrari. Um, this Ferrari <laughs> with such limited resources. It's just, it's really incredible. Um, 
I have a question um, because anytime I see you here, I uh, want to find out about what's happening with Neary Lagoon uh, with the, the trails there. I, the fencing's done, things look good. Um, on the other side, segment 7B is almost there. Um, and I know that there's some areas where some additional tr repairs are warranted. Just wondering if that's programmed, where you're at in terms of being able to make that happen. It's a great question. I appreciate that. Yeah, there's a lot of work going on at Near Your Lagoon with the fencing and improvements there. I don't have an update on um, it, trail work specifically in Neary Lagoon, but I can get that information and, and follow up. Um, just on the recent um, grant that we got through um, the Habitat Conservation Fund, that is wrapping up, and um, so the new decking is in place, and the new interpretive signs will be going in in the coming weeks. Oh, so yay. Thank yay. That, that is one thing that is Thank very you. nearly tied up in a bow. Great. Um, I thought you were going to ask, what about the pool? Which is going to be my question. <laughs> but I'm going to wait on that. That's the I'll end with that question. I just want to say, first, first and foremost, there's no question that your division department, staff, the individuals care so deeply about the work they do, and it doesn't go unnoticed by us or by our community. And 100% recognize the challenges as you clearly articulate with the experiences just within one of our facilities and one of our spaces, right? And so um, certainly wanting to have that conversation with my colleagues around how to move forward with, with more investment and resources. And I know I've talked to the city manager about that, specifically for this valued attribute of our community that it makes it so exceptional. Um, and I wanted to see about the pool. And I and I'm just I didn't hear I heard it, but I didn't see it in the goals. And I'm wondering, you know, if there's an interest in wanting to have that as an explicit goal, given it's been a priority for so long to have the pool running. We're an ocean community. There's been more issues that have come before our public safety committee around mm -hmm. ocean safety. Having a community pool is so essential. At, and it's sad to see it so underutilized for so many years. And I know we've talked about wanting to have it, but I feel like however we can start to move that forward, and I know we're doing assessments, et cetera, but I was hoping to see it in the goals. And I'm wondering if that's something you either want to speak to that I may have missed or we want to consider adding potentially. Yes. Yeah, great question. We could certainly add it uh, to the list here. Okay. Um, happy to do that. Um, just an update on everything that's happening related to the pool, and I'll try to be uh, brief on this. So we did uh, initiate a pool feasibility study. We've actually just completed that in the past week or two uh, to look at uh, the condition of the pool uh, and to evaluate the, the market, uh, what are the aquatics needs in our city and in our county, uh, and then to look more broadly at our region in terms of what what's the sort of state of the art in terms of um, aquatics facilities and what range of options might we have here in Santa Cruz to, to provide that service. So, um, and we haven't shared that document yet with the council. We need to get that out uh, soon. But in summary, it's a range from a roughly, say, a four to five million dollar investment in the existing pool to bring it up to um, a safe operational standards. To there are a lot of pools over the hill. Uh, there are 30, 35, 40 million dollar aquatics complexes. So that's kind of that that Cadillac or Ferrari uh, end of that. So everywhere in between. So these are decisions that we will um, uh, bring in a more formal way, and we can have discussion over time what that might look like. Um, as far as the pool currently, so we uh, are looking for a partner. So we do not have staff to uh, have the experience or training to maintain a pool. Uh, nor the capacity to maintain a pool. So uh, we had a, um, a tentative partnership with Santa Cruz County Parks and Rec last year that uh, didn't work out. We're looking to work with a group called Quicksilver um, to be our operator. So they would do both the maintenance and operations of the pool um, under contract, which would be great. Uh, to get to that point, we have to fix the pool. So we spent about $150,000 on the pool this summer. Uh, we thought it was up and ready to go. We got all of our permits from county environmental health. It continues to fail. So we have a variety of valves in our main pump that continue to fail in the pool. So we, um, 
we we're we're using all the resources and duct tape we can to try to get it up and uh, up and running in a safe way. So we want to make sure that we can get it permitted through county environmental health to be safe. Um, but that's where we are. So our goal right now is to fix the pool um, and to get our operating agreement with Quicksilver um, and ideally open the pool by June this summer. Okay. Uh, so it could be a, a sort of modified schedule. There's a lot of what ifs there, but we hope to open by June this summer. That's really wonderful to hear. And I appreciate your response to that. And I, it would be great even just to see that so that we can also share that with our community. Um, I just feel like you can pay for lessons, right? And, and then there's so many that just don't know how to swim or learn how to swim. And I was talking to a colleague recently and they were saying there's not a lot of people who can get into the conservation and science who do diving and because of exposure and diversity. And so we don't have the answer to all of that, but we certainly can play a part. And that's what a community pool can do, um, as well as diversify our, stu our students that can go into our junior lifeguards program, right? And so mm -hmm. I think it's a really important asset to see, and if it could be reflected in the goals, that would be you know, something I'd be interested in moving forward if my colleagues are as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I do know this, I, I recognize the struggle, I certainly do. And I, I think if there's anything that we can do as a, as a governing body to support that, that goal move forward, I'm, I'm certainly open to that. I also hear what you're saying in terms of the spectrum of options, right? Like, in, and I don't know, I know the schools have, I, I'm all over the place with my kid at this moment with like a lot of the swimming stuff and the pools are at capacity. Like, mm -hmm. so there's certainly a need in terms of like, wanting to have more pool time, right? So, I don't know, we can just continue the conversation, but just to see that, just to share that, I hope that you feel supported as you move forward with that goal and we can try to find the resources to make it happen. Anyways, thank you, Mayor. You took one of my questions mm -hmm. uh, oh, and ideas. My second one, so you'll keep me, you'll keep me more brief. Um, so somebody, one question I have that the, the, the trail steward um, group mentioned was the rangers. Is that something that you guys would want, or is that something that was taken away not just because of budgets, because it was too much to manage? Because I know it was ultimately in the police departments when it when it did get taken away, it was taken away from PD, not from you. Is he the city manager? I'm happy to chime question. in on that one, yeah. and um, I'm sure Mr. Elliott will have some follow-up comments. But um, we're we're in active discussion around how we can ensure that our parks and open space are safe for our community members as well as our staff. Um, so Tony, uh, Tony and I and Chief Escalante actually have a meeting, follow-up meeting next week with Coastal Watershed Council on this very topic. We, uh, we recently had a meeting with uh, Santa Cruz um, Mountains Trails, uh, Trails Stewardship. Uh, also, with regards to the M.M. Curry Trail that you were referencing earlier yes. today, <laughs> Councilmember Golder, uh, to explore what those options uh, could be. That may not be uh, a return of the Ranger program as it existed traditionally. Uh, but it could be some form of a parks and open space safety division that uh, would allow us to have an increased presence in those areas to try to mitigate some of the impacts that we're experiencing. There needs to be resources and budget to come with that, but it is something that we're exploring. Um, okay, my, my next question um, was, um, in terms of paying for in repairs and maintenance, what budget do you use for that? And I, I, I didn't know if I saw it in there and I missed it. I missed it. We talked last night. For general repairs yeah. and maintenance, um, we do have a um, services and supplies budget um, across the department that's broken out by activity. Um, when we uh, talked about the budget last year, um, about 80% uh, of that services and supplies budget kind of goes to like the basic keeping the lights on. Um, paying electri electricity bills, paying water bills. Um, and so there's about 20% of that uh, budget that is um, for use to do things like improve landscapes, um, take care of turf maintenance, those types of things. So um, I believe across the entire budget, we have about um, six to seven million in that services and supplies. Um, but when, when it comes down to it, like what we have to work with is closer to around two million a year. And so then, like in terms of capital improvement, deferred maintenance, and things like that, I'm just—I know there's a lot. 
and I know we talked about this at Public Safety in terms of the developments that are coming through planning, and we've so far kind of exempted affordable housing. Is this the same case with um, from developer fees for parks? Is that the same for you, or do they have to pay developer fees they, regardless of? Sorry, that's a great no, question. Yeah, defar, defar, regardless if they're uh, yeah. affordable, or affordable or not. Yeah, um, it depends. Um, so we have a couple of tools when it comes to um, generating our own um, revenue to fund CIP work across the system. Um, it is driven by development, so that makes it a little unpredictable in terms of how and when that comes in. Um, Quimby fees um, provide a portion of that, um, and our park tax provides um, a larger majority um, of that. The park tax... Uh, Developers are exempt um, if they are building ADUs, um, so and that's a state law. So any ADU under 750 feet, um, those first 750 feet are exempt from fees, but then um, we have generally been able to apply fees um, beyond that and on most developments. Um, we have been approached and been asked to waive fees for affordable um, housing developments um, and um, up to this point, um, we've tried to make the case for, you know, continuing to build the parks and recreation impact fees into that um, so that we can make sure that everybody who is moving in and going to enjoy different parts of our community are going to have thriving, well-maintained parks. Okay, thank you. And I just want to say you didn't give yourself enough credit with your teamwork and um, solving complex problems like Beach Street vending and sure. West Cliff and mm -hmm. closing the Benchlands encampment and collaborating with the schools in, in ways that also bring equity to um, our community. So thank you for that. Yeah, Ms. thank Colbert you. Um, ditto, ditto, ditto. Thank you for all of the incredible work. And I was also going to bring Harvey West pool up. So my colleagues brought that up. I was also going to bring Neri Lagoon up. Um, I know there's been a lot of work that's been put into Neri Lagoon, and um, just I've started to dive into the Neri Lagoon master plan, and I think there's more that can be done there for activation. And I don't know that it needs to be um, called out specifically in here. If it can, that would be great. I was specifically thinking about um, um, just accessibility. I mean, that's such a that 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 goal under the goal accessibility. It's such a place where um, people of all ages can use, but it's under accessed. Um, so maybe a question, maybe a suggestion of of specifically calling out Neri Lagoon activation, and then so I guess these aren't questions; these are just <laughs> comments. Um, the other is under partnership. I was so. Glad to see the increased engagement with the Youth Action Network. Um, and I wanted to ask that we add and the city youth liaison um, to that bullet point. Um, and then I did have a question. Looking at how, how much is brought in through grant funds, uh, as with my grant writing hat on, it seems actually kind of low. Um, I, I haven't written specifically a Parks and Rec grant for a city or, or a jurisdiction. Um, but the question is, are we working with, do we still have the grant consultants? Are we working with those grant consultants? And have we considered partnering with other community organizations so that we could increase those funds? I think it was like 700,000 a year. Like we, sh we I'm, I'm sure we could get like 5 million, maybe that's shooting high, but um, it seems like there should be more funds out there. And, and, and sometimes you just have to think creatively, like the trail stores, like, you know, that's um, building youth assets and that's keeping youth from a pathway to the justice system. I mean, there's so many opportunities that we, if you think out the, outside the box and you partner with the right partners, we can bring in additional funds. So that's a question and a comment about grant funds. <laughs> Yeah, great question. Thank you for that. On grant funding, I agree. We've got uh, opportunities to grow uh, our grant funding. Historically, uh, where we've been a little bit challenged um, in terms of uh, being really competitive on grants is that we are a, um, uh, what I've, I'll describe as a sort of parks-rich town. We have a lot of parks. We've got a lot of acreage. We've got 96% of our community is within a 10-minute walk of a park which were in the top in the nation in, in that respect. So 
a lot of grants are uh, oriented toward um, uh, communities that have park deserts or lower income communities or um, under resourced communities. And so on paper, we, in a lot of cases, don't meet those marks. But totally agree with the point about being creative. And so where we have found success, it's working with uh, partners like Coastal Watershed Council, for example. We've got partner grants with them, uh, with the Museum of Natural History and so forth. So leveraging um, like AARP, for example. So some opportunities there that we can leverage. So, but I agree there's more work to do there. Um, need to be more creative uh, there. Um, there's a philanthropic side of this as well that we want to tap into, and we've um, found some philanthropic support through the Community Foundation of Santa Cruz County. Um, but we, uh, sort of within the city, are friends of Parks and Recreation. There's a lot of opportunity there to really grow the philanthropic side of this um, as well. And so currently, FOPAR does not generate uh, annual revenue to invest in city parks and rec. And so that's part of a healthy parks and rec department. Uh, both on the grant side, but on that philanthropic side as well. And, and um, just that first question: Do we are we still engaged with our grant consultants? Yeah, we are engaged with our our excuse me outside grant consultants. Um, all of our departments are working very closely with them on several fronts, and I know that Tony's team does from time to time as well. Um, and I think there's more opportunity there. One of the areas that we've also not focused on uh, much today uh, when it comes to budget and resources. One of our areas of focus uh, as we move into to FY24 and 25 is sustainable funding for Parks and Rec. Mm -hmm. um, the work on the sales tax really took center stage and attention over the course of this last year. But there's some really great work that the Land for, uh, the land for Public Trust put together uh, over the course of the last couple of years that we're going to be dusting off and looking at those opportunities as we move forward in addition to the grants as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for all the amazing work. Yeah, just a couple of additional comments on grants. Um, it does ebb and flow. Um, so this fiscal year, we'll be able to report a million dollar uh, community urban forestry grant. We've been successful in gathering and looking to leverage that grant to go after additional Cal Fire aligned grants um, and directing those funds to align with our incredible Santa Cruz Street Tree Master Plan. Um, our urban forestry team, as Tony mentioned, um, is under-resourced. Um, they are a small but mighty team. So being able to direct the grant resources specifically to gaps outlined in this plan um, just kind of speaks to the importance of doing these types of efforts um, so that when we have those opportunities, we can deploy them strategically as a department. So just an example, but um, I think there's a lot of desire to grow that and work with amazing people in the city like um, Dr. Wise West. Thank you. Council Member Brenner. Thank you. I won't um, repeat a lot of the comments. Uh, just thank you so much. It's always amazing to me the multifaceted uh, department that Parks and Rec is and the roles that you play in our community. And so this report, you know, really outlines the values, the mission, and the impact, and many of the highlights. And I, I know it's not, um, it's a small part of what you do, but for me, I just want to thank you really for the equity component. We've made a lot of strides in that since I've joined council in 2020, and that looks many different ways in our systems, in our access. You've worked with community members and stakeholders. to. We've gotten at some really good progress in that area and partnerships and, um, you know, around uh, and, and youth and, and, and seniors and um, just so many um, ways that you've really addressed that through Parks and Rec and programs and um, permits and um, thank you. I just wanted to call that out really because um, that is huge and I hope to see under goals some roller skating surfaces. <laughs> I will continue to talk about that. Multi-use courts, smooth roller skating surfaces, and equity in that um, area. <laughs> and I half joke, but I'm half serious. Um, 
about, you know, just really, you've done a great job in that area, and I know that the work will continue, and um, I hope to continue finding ways to support your department and your staff, and they're out there in so many ways working really hard, um, so thank you. Thank you so much for the questions and comments. Anybody with us wish to make a comment on the item? Matters back before the I body. I believe. Someone online. Excuse, oh, there is someone online. Uh, person online. Good afternoon. Welcome. Okay. Good afternoon, Council. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, this is Eric Rodberg, and I want to um, also speak about the Harvey West Pool. I'm actually missing my swim right now. I'm forced to swim at UCSC, which is often closed and inconvenient to get to. Um, we really, really, really need a pool. It's disgraceful that a community like ours doesn't have one. Um, and I've spoken before council on this topic before, I think the last time, only uh, council members Watkins and uh, Brown were on council. So, uh, and I know the Master Swim Club, which I'm not a part of also, showed up in force one evening. So this is a long standing issue and there are so many things that come before council that are, let's just say it, they're kind of crazy. They don't always have much to do with Santa Cruz. And this is really a core thing. A city needs a public pool. It's, it's really a core function. And I think as politicians, you guys would be a lot more popular if you get this done. And I realize there are a lot of challenges. It just uh, <laughs> looks like. Measures KNL are passing. I don't know if you can take any of that extra money, but whatever it is, you need to really make it a priority. I mean, one year, I know it's a state grant. We got $14 million for, for homeless issues, and I know that's a real problem and a difficult one, but you also need to provide basic things for the everyday, ordinary person. And so I can't agree with uh, Councilmember Watkins enough, and I know other, other of you wanted to repeat what she said. So just figure out how to get it done. Prioritize it, please. Also, in the interim, make an agreement with the high school so that city residents can use the high school pool when, when high school is not in session. San Lorenzo Valley does it. There's no reason we can't do it. It's a perfect centralized location, and it's not a perfect solution, but it would be a good interim solution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your thoughtful input. Anyone else online? No. Matters back for the body. I'll recognize a council member for a motion. There's a motion by Ms. Brown. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I would move to accept the fiscal year 2023 Parks and Recreation Annual Report and direct department staff to continue their evaluation of service levels, service offerings, and associated resources in the delivery of fiscal year 2024 goals. I would like to add uh, inclusion of um, continued uh, work toward, I'm not sure how we would say this, continuing to work on the pool master plan. Get that in there. And um, I always want to put Neri Lagoon in <laughs> the goals. And so if we, if other council members, I heard council member Kalantari Johnson uh, was. Let's make sure we get a motion. Oh, here. I'm sorry. Let's keep going. Sorry. I, 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 it, it's, it's, it's ingrained in me. OK, um, so uh, to also include act uh, efforts to activate Neri Lagoon in the there goals. Is, there is a motion. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second, and I have a question. Second and real quick. Prefer. Absolutely. Okay. Real quick. Yeah, um, do we need to specify that adding the youth city youth liaison is part of the motion, or you got that and not necessary? You got that. Okay. okay. All right. May open on your motion, Ms. Brown. Well, I already did. <laughs> <laughs> So I uh, really want to appreciate <laughs> Council Member Watkins for, you know, I know that the, the uh, feasibility study is happening and things are in process, but to really call that out, I think is important and um, love to hear uh, Neri Lagoon is getting some love from its council member as well. Vice Mayor. I just have a couple of things, and I don't know if they need to be added to the motion or if they can just be just some additional direction, but I think to the extent 
possible, working with other departments in um, coordination, breaking up encampments when they get to a certain threshold, and I don't know what that is. I'll leave that up to you guys as the experts, but it seems to me that when they get to a capacity where there's an outbreak like the one in Friendship Garden or the Benchlands that we're wasting valuable resources that could be used on other things to clean those up. And so using every tool in your tool belt and working together it would be something I would like to see. Um, I don't, do you need additional direction or can that just be? I'll, I'll chime in on that one. Um, that's currently the process yeah. as it stands now. We have yeah. a, a, what we refer to as the encampment assessment team that meets on a weekly basis. It's cross-departmental. Uh, Tony's staff and our, our parks team are working very closely with Public Works and our homelessness response team. Um, and of course, with all that collective support, we're, we're also resource constrained at times sure. uh, to address those encampments. But we'll continue that, that collaboration. They're working together in ways um, that we've not seen before and uh, really making progress on, on addressing and really working to, uh, working to avoid those large encampments from forming. Uh, Friendship's Garden is, is one of those areas that's on the radar um, as soon as we move through the current situation related to the outbreak, but we will eventually address that area as well. Okay, thank you. And then I know that the resources, there's a push and a pull throughout the city, but I think the way you've collaborated with outside partners, I think Eric had a great idea of reaching out to the schools and seeing if there's a way we can make an MOU to make those schools available um, for the public to have swim hours. That would be awesome. And then um, I guess my, f my, my, yeah, my final, I don't, that's it. That's all my final things. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you. Further? Council Member Watkins is recognized. Thank you, Mayor. Certainly. I certainly agree with the direction and appreciate the motion. I wonder if, and this is partially just so that I'm not badgering you guys, um, if we could have an update in about, I don't know, like, four months or so on just so we keep the conversation about the pool going because we have questions that come to us and we're like well we heard this and there's that and we don't really know and i know it's fluid in terms of changing but at least we'll be aware and if there's an opportunity or a need for us to intervene with any kind of policy direction for support and that feels good like we'll know but i feel like when it's a year and then there's just there's just like sort of a gap right and so if we can get an update on the progress of that goal as well as others um in the next four to six months. Council Member Brown. Just to add, um, it, it feels, I know it's um, sooner than that, but um, maybe at budget time, uh, we, we might uh, think about how we're going to support those efforts if there's a match or if there's something that we need that we could help with to try to demonstrate that commitment so maybe that would be a good time yeah if i could just add to that tony and i haven't had a chance to talk about this but um i think if the timing alliance perhaps what tony's team could do is bring forward the economic feasibility work that's been done around the pool and hopefully by that time we'll, we'll have more certainty around whether or not this partnership with quicksilver is going to materialize with the goal of us opening the pool right around that same time as well. So we can work towards bringing those updates. And just quickly, as far as communication, we can um, make a commitment to update the city website as well on what's going on with the pool, just so that we, we've we got that ongoing uh, sort of information available for the public. Thank you. That's great. Further questions, comments, observations? Wish list for budget hearings? <laughs> All right, <laughs> seeing hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watson? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Valentari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Uh, Mr. Director, a very final thing on, on, on page five of your report. I mean, uh, the council is concerned about a particular, I'll, I'll just go with you, uh, talk to you about it right afterwards. All right. Uh, is there further business to come before the body? Seeing near none, Ms. Bush, no more business. Mr. Condotti, no more business. Motion to adjourn. Motion. Vice Mayor makes motion to adjourn. Council Member Newsom with deep, deep Good reluctance luck. seconds the motion. <laughs> Non-debatable. Those in favor signify by saying I oppose. Motion right. carries. So order. We stand adjourned. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> I know. Good. 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 Good.